Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Living with Myeloproliferative Neoplasms, organized by the Florida Society of Clinical Oncology. FLASCO is a member-supported state society that focuses on supporting and representing the oncology workforce in Florida. Together, FLASCO is the voice of oncology in Florida. Many of the individuals presenting and participating in this webinar are members of FLASCO, and we appreciate their support. My name is Dr. Andrew Kirkendall, and I am an assistant member at Moffitt Cancer Center in the Department of Malignant Hematology. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. Our topic today is living with myeloproliferative neoplasms. Our oncology experts will discuss the disease itself and treatment options, and then move on to more individually focused areas, including support for caregivers, advocacy, and MPN resources. <clears throat> Before we begin the presentations, we'd like to thank Insight for sponsoring this webinar and making it possible for us to share this important information. I'd also like to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded so that those who are unable to attend can view it at a later time. Please note that your lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar. Toward the end of the meeting, we will host a Q&A and we will encourage you to submit questions or comments via the on-screen questions box on your GoToWebinar panel. We will discuss as many questions as time permits. I am honored to introduce our amazing group of panelists. I will briefly introduce them, but please read their impressive bios and the meeting material that was emailed to you. The link to download the meeting materials is also in the handouts box on your GoToWebinar panel. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Sarah Tinsley, a nurse practitioner working in malignant hematology at Moffitt Cancer Center. She is a member of the International Nurse Leadership Board for the Myelitis Plastic Syndrome Foundation. Her research focuses on evaluation and improvement of quality of life for patients diagnosed with hematologic malignancies. Also joining our panel is Lindsay Nyenbrink, an oncology social worker at the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. She specializes in solid tumors and provides emotional support, resources, and referrals to patients and caregivers. Our next panelist is Lauren Walcott. Lauren is a patient and community outreach manager with Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and she brings almost 20 years of experience working with children and families in a variety of child welfare settings. Our final panelist is Dr. Michael Diaz. Dr. Diaz joined Florida Cancer Specialists and Research Institute, FCS, in 2011 and currently serves on its executive board and as the assistant managing physician slash vice president. In addition, he serves as the director of patient advocacy for the FLASCO and on multiple work groups for ASCO. Thank you panelists for taking the time to share your perspectives on the different facets of living with MPNs. We will begin our presentations with my own, what is MPN? <clears throat> then I will discuss managed care, how treatment is organized and managed between academic centers and local practices. Great. Um, so I'm very excited to kind of get started with this. And so the first talk we have is going to be talking about what really is MPN um, and, and how we view it. Um, and then we'll go into more specific things. So, so this is a slide that I like to show to get a better understanding of, of how we think about MPNs. And I show this to residents and fellows and medical students as well as patients because I think it helps to, to put this in context within this broader kind of scary world of leukemia that we talk about. And so when we think about leukemias or, or, or cancers that affect blood cells, we immediately kind of separate these things into myeloid leukemias or lymphoid leukemias. Um, and myeloid leukemias uh, deal with myeloid cells. So these are types of blood cells, and these include your red blood cells, your platelets, and most of your white blood cells. And then when we think about myeloid type leukemias or myeloid type disorders, we break that down into acute myeloid disorders or chronic myeloid disorders. For acute myeloid disorders, that's what people often think about when we think about leukemia, this big word that has this connotation that's very intense and, and very overwhelming. Um, in acute leukemias, we're often talking about chemotherapy, uh, hospitalization, people are very sick. Um, uh, many times people have to get uh, bone marrow or stem cell transplants. Um, and, and we do have great treatments for acute leukemias, but they're very different than what we offer for chronic leukemias. And the disease itself is just very different. For chronic leukemias, we separate that into people that have this specific 
genetic abnormality in their blood called a BCR able translocation or something they call having the Philadelphia chromosome. And those people are deemed to have chronic myelogenous or chronic myeloid leukemia. And we have specific pills and treatments for that. And it's actually one of the biggest success stories uh, of oncology treatment over the past, I mean, maybe forever, but certainly over the past three decades. Uh, and then you have a group of people that don't have that. And, and that's where we kind of fall in this myeloproliferative neoplasm, MPN spectrum. Um, and these are, so these are chronic myeloid type leukemias. These are chronic overproduction of these myeloid cells, um, but they don't have this specific uh, genetic uh, abnormality that, that constitutes CML. Um, and the classic myeloproliferative neoplasms that we discuss are polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia or myelofibrosis. Um, and we often will, will note those as PV, ET, or MF because they're very long and hard to say, and especially when you have to say it over and over again. So uh, next slide. And so how do we think about MPNs? And I think that, that many times, you know, acute myeloid leukemia is, is, is the rabbit and, and, and many times the, the myeloproliferative neoplasm is is, is the tortoise. Um, and so I think that many times we think about it as the tortoise. Next slide. But that doesn't mean that sometimes the tortoise can't go very fast and act in a very aggressive way. And certainly this is a, a tortoise that for some people uh, may not behave in an aggressive way, but in others, it's very, very different. Next slide. And so I often try to incorporate some, some logic from, from Michael Scott from the office. And so uh, you know, I think that that he he posed a question, which is, would I rather be feared or loved? And he says, easy both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. And I, I think that this is one of the the caveats or the challenges when thinking about myeloproliferative neoplasms, because often patients are told, oh, you have the good type of leukemia. Um, but but I don't think that that's how people feel most of the time. I think given the the proliferation of symptoms and um, and and the the burden of having to live with this disease for for you know, a long time and being aware of it, it, it can be a, a real a real challenge and, and something that shouldn't be taken lightly. Next slide. So if there's any slide that, that's a take home, this is the one, I think this is in an incredibly busy slide and I'll go through it step by step, but this is really kind of everything there is to know about myeloproliferative neoplasms in one slide. And so um, when we think about these three diseases, ET, PV, and myelofibrosis, while they are separate diseases in many facets, they can also be thought of as a, a spectrum. Um, uh, so the, the, on one end of the spectrum, you have ET, um, and this is typically uh, associated with what we would say maybe a lower disease burden. And by that, I mean if there's, there's uh, the bone marrow typically looks a little bit more normal. Um, there is uh, uh, l less of your blood cells have the affected mutation, such as maybe the JAK2 mutation. Um, and it, there's also an increasing amount of complexity as you go left to right. So as you go from ET to PV to myelofibrosis. Additionally, these, these diseases can transform from one to another. So someone who starts off with a diagnosis of ET may evolve to a diagnosis of PV or MF. Similarly, they can involve straight from ET to myelofibrosis. We also have this new diagnostic entity of prefibrotic myelofibrosis, which is someone who doesn't meet the criteria for myelofibrosis, but certainly has a bone marrow that looks like that it may turn into that in some time. Each of these diseases is hallmarked by having a so-called driver mutation, and the vast majority of patients will have a mutation in one of three genes. The most prominent and the most talked about is, is JAK2. Um, and this is a gene that's involved in blood cell production. And, and when this gene gets mutated, your bone marrow kind of flips the switch on and is thinks it constantly should be making blood cells. This mutation was discovered, or mutations in this gene were discovered in 2005. And that's really what's led to it, an increased biologic understanding of these diseases and hopefully will soon translate into better treatments. Now, virtually everyone with polycythemia vera will have a JAK2 mutation. But for those patients with ET or myelofibrosis, they can also have less common mutations in genes called MPL or MIPL or calreticulin, we, we abbreviate as CalR. Um, and so one of the first things we try to do in any patient diagnosed with an MPN is try to determine whether or not they have one of these mutations and specifically which one do they have. Now going through each of these diseases, 
you know, ET, we're often talking about too many platelets. That's really the hallmark of the disease. When we look in the bone marrow, we see really a normal amount of blood cells, but too many of these platelet producing cells that we call megakaryocytes. These are big old cells that produce platelets. Um, <clears throat> when we look at polycythemia vera, we often think about too many red blood cells, but you can also have too many white blood cells and too many platelets as well. And when we look in the bone marrow, we see too many cells. So it's, it's just an overactive bone marrow um, and it's all, all sorts of cells are overactive. For myelofibrosis, it's a little bit less clear. We see sometimes too many cells, sometimes we see not enough. So many pa times patients are anemic. They don't have enough red blood cells or their thrombocytopenia, their platelets can be low. Um, and when we look in the bone marrow, we see a little bit more confusion going on. So, so the cells in there look a little bit more atypical and we start to see this scar tissue uh, or fibrosis that forms in there due to just chronic inflammation that's going on in the bone marrow. Next slide. And so when we talk about these mutations and we talk about the disease, I think that, that, that oftentimes, you know, as, a, as, as someone who does a lot of research into this, I, I get a little stuck on talking about these genetic mutations and, and sometimes people's eyes glaze over. But the way I view this is that when we look at your blood counts and we talk about your symptoms and we, and we measure how big your spleen is, you know, that's the disease on the surface. That's the body of the car. Um, that's what we can see. But then often when we're talking about mutations and, and cytogenetics, which is the chromosome makeup of your blood cells, um, what we're trying to get a sense for is the engine. You know, the, 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 the over kind of the clinical phenotype or the, the things we can see, you know, with our eyes and feel and look uh, at labs, that's, that just shows, that, that tells us how fast the car is going. Um, but the genetic understanding tells us how fast the car could go in the future. Next slide. And so for those that are interested, this is a little summary slide of, of why these mutations act the way they do and how they actually, um, you know, play a role. Um, for, uh, for, for JAK2 mutations, you can actually, if you look closely, uh, there is uh, the, the red, the, on the inside of these cells, there's a, there's a red uh, mark there that those are, are, are JAK2 mutations. And you can see these red proteins actually interact with MIPL, which is the receptor responsible for making platelets. They also, re they also associate with this EPO receptor, which is the receptor responsible for making red blood cells. And then they also associate with the receptor responsible for making white blood cells. So that, so that explains why when you get a mutation in this gene, you, you start to over uh, produce all of these types of blood cells. On the, uh, the, the, on the other hand, when you have a mutation in MIPL, MIPL is the gene that encodes the protein that is responsible for making platelets. And so when that gene is mutated and starts to, to, starts to be active all the time, you really just end up with too many platelets. And, in, and then in time, you can also have too much fibrosis, but you don't really see too overproduction of red blood cells in people that have a MIPL mutation. And what we've learned recently is calreticulin or CalR mutations act very similar to MIPL mutations uh, based on how they act. So I know that's getting into the weeds a little bit, but sometimes I think it helps to understand that these driver mutations functionally make sense and why they lead to the, the, the dysfunctional blood cell production. Next slide. So then what do we do? And so we'll go back to Michael Scott, who says, I knew exactly what to do, but in a much more real sense, I had no idea what to do. Um, and oftentimes I think this is, this is how physicians see myeloproliferative diseases. I think that you know, there's a general there's a general idea of how to treat them, but when you're looking at a patient and you're dealing with this complex variety of symptoms, it can be a, it can be a challenge to figure out how best to treat each individual person. Next slide. So here is my general approach to treating myeloproliferative neoplasms. I think the first question that I ask is: Is an attempt at curing this disease worth the risk? And the reason I say is it worth the risk is we really only have one way of curing the disease, and that's by doing a bone marrow or stem cell transplant, which is a, 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 a treatment that comes with a high degree of both morbidity and mortality, meaning that even when successful, it can cause long-term challenges uh, and side effects. And then also there is a chance that it's not gonna be successful. Oftentimes uh, when I'm talking to our transplant physicians, the estimate they'll give is that for many patients, the chance of dying within one year of a transplant 
for transplant related reasons, not even related to the disease, is somewhere around 10 to 20 percent based on the condition of the patient who's undergoing the transplant. And that's certainly a risky dice to roll unless the disease itself is so risky that it's, it, it makes sense. And so the first question I always ask is, is it worthwhile to attempt curing this patient uh, based on the disease they have? And if so, then I'll talk to our transplant physicians and start that process. Typically, this is reserved for, for patients that are, are fit, meaning not too many other health problems, meaning so they think that they can tolerate this procedure. And, and this is also typically reserved for patients with higher risk myelofibrosis. It's not something that we would do for essential thrombocythemia or polycythemia vera. So then the next question I ask is what current disease-related problems can I improve in this patient? Um, and so some patients have constitutional symptoms, which we typically refer to as fevers, chills, night sweats, bone pain, weight loss. Um, some patients have enlarged spleens. Others have refractory or just very challenging itching that can be present at all times or can occur after showers or with different exposures. Fatigue, headaches, uh, symptoms related to anemia. Um, and then all of these are things that I would say, you know, this is a reason to focus on symptoms that are right in front of me at this point in time. Then the next question is, what future disease-related problems can I try to prevent? Can I try to prevent thrombosis, blood clots in the arteries or the veins? Obviously, in the arteries, this would be heart attacks and strokes. In the veins, this is uh, DVTs or PEs. All of these things can be life-threatening. So do I need to focus on that? Can I try to prevent bleeding? Uh, people with myeloproliferative neoplasms are at risk for increased risk for clotting and bleeding. Can I try to prevent disease progression? Well, frankly, we'd, love to, we'd like to do that, but oftentimes, you know, we don't have great data that suggests that any of the agents we have available can do that. Can I try to prevent organ damage from iron overload from recurrent transfusions? And can I try to prevent pul portal or pulmonary hypertension in patients that uh, may have risk factors for those conditions? Next slide. So I'm going to go through each disease uh, specifically just to talk about the treatment approach um, and hopefully uh, uh, kind of explain how we view this. And so um, essential thrombocythemia, as I mentioned, is kind of the earliest, on, maybe the first on the spectrum, but certainly comes with, with challenges. Um, and so the first thing we do is try to risk stratify people, meaning to figure out how, what, what is their risk of having a thrombosis or bleeding event? Um, because that really is our focus and our goal of therapy is to reduce the risk of thrombotic events, while at the same time taking care of, of patient's symptoms to have them live the, as, as good a life as they can for as long as they can. And we know that 40% of the mortality that comes with myeloproliferative neoplasms comes from cardiovascular issues, which is, which is why we focus on, on preventing thrombotic events. And so when we think about risk status, we look, at three, look, we look at three things, age, presence of a JAK2 mutation, history of a thrombosis. Now, if you have a history of a thrombosis, you're automatically high risk. If you have a history, if you're also older than the age of 60 and have a JAK2 mutation, you qualify as being high risk. For high-risk patients, uh, we're typically uh, uh, doing uh, putting people on a baby aspirin, sometimes once, sometimes twice daily, uh, and we're starting something called cytoreductive therapy. And typically, this is you know historically this is referred to hydroxyurea, but increasingly we're referring to things like interferons uh, or anagrelide, which is not that often used but can still be used in some cases. Now, if you don't have any of those things. If you're younger than the age of 60, don't have a JAK2 mutation, don't have a thrombo, don't have a history of thrombosis, you're considered very low risk. And in those patients, we really think the risk for thrombosis is quite low. And really, while we do treat most patients with a baby aspirin, it, it, it's, it's debatable whether or not that's necessary in these very low risk patients. And then in between, we have these low risk and intermediate risk, which I look at quite similarly. Low risk is if you have a JAK2 mutation, but other, otherwise you're younger than the age of 60 and you don't have a history of thrombosis. Intermediate is if you're just older than age 60, but you don't have a JAK2 mutation, a history of thrombosis. And in both of these uh, conditions, I, I, I kind of recommend being on a baby aspirin and then uh, typically we'll, we'll discuss the idea of cytoreductive therapy and really consider the risks and benefits for each individual patient. Historically, we've favored using cytoreductive therapy in intermediate risk patients. Um, and we've kind of avoided it in low-risk patients. But I think our understanding of these diseases and our recommendations are certainly evolving. And I think it's worth a discussion so that this can be a shared decision with patients. Next slide. For polycythemia vera, our risk stratification is based on the same 
variables. However, pretty much everyone has a JAK2 mutation, so we don't really consider that a separate variable. So it really comes down to, are you older than the age of 60? Have you had a prior thrombosis? thrombosis? If either of these things is true, we consider you to be high risk. If neither of these things are true, then we consider you to be low risk. For everyone with polycythemia vera, we recommend a baby aspirin, and we recommend phlebotomies, or taking blood from you, uh, to keep your hematocrit less than 45%. For people that are high risk, meaning older than the age of 60, or have a prior thrombosis, we often will discuss adding in cytoreductive therapy. Cytoreductive therapy typically, as I mentioned, includes hydroxyurea, uh, but can also include interferon. Uh, as a second line agent, ruxolitinib or Jacify is approved for polycythemia vera. And then in certain cases, people will still utilize an, uh, kind of an older drug, which is a chemotherapy drug called busulfan for count control if we have no other options. Next slide. Now, for primary myelofibrosis or myelofibrosis, we have many different risk uh, stratification models, um, way more than we have for PV and ET. And likely, this is just because it's a much more complicated disease that, that we're really uh, focused on figuring out what to do with patients. Now, I will say that these risk stratification models really exist to be able to identify higher, higher risk patients to see who would be eligible or reasonable to consider a transplant in. Beyond that, these these risk models don't do much um, and so really while while people will utilize these in many different ways ways shapes and forms the goal of this is to identify pa patients that have high risk disease where the risk benefit of going to transplant would be worthwhile now the original uh, prognostic models were just solely clinical looked at uh, things like hemoglobin white blood cells uh, uh, constitutional symptoms age uh, and the presence of circulating so-called blasts. And that's really the IPSS and the dips. Then further along, we started to incorporate other things like cytogenetics and high-risk mutations. And that's where we start to see the dips plus and the MIPS 70 and the MIPS 70 plus and the MIPS 70 plus version 2.0 and the dips. And then there's this other model called the MISEC PM, which is specific to patients that had either essential thrombocythemia or polycythemia vera that then progressed into myelofibrosis. Next slide. And then when I think about the treatment algorithm for, uh, for myelofibrosis, it's also a little bit more uh, confusing because it's a, it's a more challenging disease. So as we said, the first question is, is the disease risky enough uh, and the patient well enough to get transplant? And in those patients, we refer them to our transplant colleagues. Then the next question is, what is my main goal of therapy? Well, if you want to reduce disease burden, AKA blast, if someone looks like they're transforming into an acute leukemia or transferring, transforming into an accelerated phase of disease, we'll often use agents called hypomethylating agents. These are things like Videza or Dacogen that are often used for myelodysplastic syndrome or acute myeloid leukemia. But we co-opt those, uh, those medications to use for our more accelerated phase patients. If the goal of treatment is to improve quality of life by way of improving patient's spleen, uh, symptoms related to spleen or constitutional symptoms like fevers, chills, night sweats, weight loss, bone pains, then we'll really reach for these JAK inhibitors such as ruxolitinib and fedratinib. And these are really the only two agents that have an FDA approval for myelofibrosis. But what they're very good at doing is improving splenomegaly, large spleens, uh, and disease-related constitutional symptoms. There's another 20 to 30% of patients that really their main problem is, is anemia. Maybe they don't have a, a symptomatic spleen or they don't have too many constitutional symptoms or those are relatively mild. And in which case anemia may be their biggest problem. And in those we'll reach for very different drugs. We'll reach the things like uh, erythropoiesis stimulating agents. These are things like Procrit. Uh, these are boosters to make more red blood cells. We'll reach for things called imids. You know, these are, these are kind of older drugs such as lenalidomide, which is known as Reprimid or thalidomide which we actually still use uh, to, to help produce red blood cells. Danazole is kind of a derivative of testosterone. It's an androgen, but can also raise red blood cell counts. In rare cases, we'll use interferons. Uh, and then we'll also use things called hypomethylating agents for anemia if we don't have any other options. These are these medications such as Videza or Dacogen that I referred to earlier that can be used in more accelerated phase disease. And then sometimes patients don't have any of those. You know, we, we find this incidentally because of abnormal blood counts, but maybe their spleen's not too big. They don't have symptoms from that. They don't have too many constitutional symptoms. Their blood counts are controlled. Those patients actually can be monitored with observation. We may just 
bring them back in for routine lab work and make sure things are going okay and we may wait. Um, some people may even offer interferon during that phase because interferon has been shown to potentially have disease modifying activity and if there is a role for it in myelofibrosis it typically tends to be earlier in the disease process. And we also have to think about, you know, myelofibrosis is still having those same mutations, the same disease process that increases the risk of thrombotic events. So maybe we reach for something like hydroxyurea if our goal is just to prevent blood clots. So we may apply the same, you know, thrombotic risk score that we did for a, maybe an essential thrombocythemia or polycythemia vera patient and say, hey, maybe we can't do some of these other things we do in myelofibrosis, but maybe we can protect you from a thrombotic event. And then the last question to ask is what additional factors are present that may impact my therapeutic choice? And these are things like low platelets, young age, other comorbidities, prior exposure to different treatments. And in these cases, you may be able to have to, mod you might have to modify your prior treatments because of these factors. A classic example is people that have low platelets where you can't give certain types of treatments to those patients because they, they run the risk of making those platelets go down even lower. Next slide. Um, and I and I'm, I I I would I can't get through a talk on myelofibrosis without getting optimistic about the agents that are coming down the pipeline. Um, and I think this is what's so exciting about this field is that while we do utilize a lot of treatments that are somewhat antiquated, uh, we think it's really important to focus on it. We, we we think that our understanding and increased understanding of the biology of the disease is very likely to lead to 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 better therapies in the future. So these are a, a, a list of agents and combination therapies that are in late phase clinical trials currently. So we have a couple new JAK inhibitors that, that hope to come onto the market, something called mamalotinib and something called picritinib. Mamalotinib is, both of these are similar to fedratinib and ruxolitinib in the sense that they can reduce spleen size and improve symptoms, but both have certain specific factors that may make them a little bit better. Mamalotinib has the ability to, to potentially improve anemia or reduce the need for transfusion, while picritinib can safely be given to patients that have very low platelet counts. Imatilostat uh, is a telomerase inhibitor that's been looked at in a phase two trial and was really looked at in a very challenging uh, refractory group of myelofibrosis patients. Um, and while it didn't, doesn't act the same way as a JAK inhibitor, so it doesn't lead to the same degree of spleen volume reduction or, or symptom reduction, People on this trial lived a lot longer than people thought they should, uh, given what we know about patients that are refractory to JAK inhibitors. And so now this is uh, an interesting agent that has really shown some preclinical evidence that it may be able to modify the disease. So this is going forward with a phase three clinical trial in patients that have, are refractory to ruxolitinib um, with, an, with an, an endpoint that is looking at overall survival, which is really exciting in this field to see that can we give something in a challenging group of patients that may actually make them live longer and maybe disease modify? You know, for a long time, you know, and still we're using spleen volume response as our, our measure of efficacy. So the idea of using overall survival as a measure certainly symbolizes a step forward in this disease. And then here are a, a group of four different combination therapies that are currently in phase three clinical trials. So you have ruxolitinib combined with something called Leviticlax. This is a BCL-XL inhibitor for, for those that are interested in the science behind it. Um, but this has shown the ability as, as an, as an add-on strategy in, in, in phase two studies where Leviticlax was able to be added to patients that had still had big spleens despite being on ruxolitinib. And it was able to get those spleens to go down significantly in about 30% of patients. So that was very encouraging. And it's moving forward with a frontline clinical trial as well as an add-on strategy phase three clinical trial. Then there's uh, a, a combination with this drug called CPI0610, which is a BET inhibitor. The new name for that is gonna be Palabrasib, Palabrasib. Um, and this is moving into phase three uh, clinical trials in the upfront setting. So patients will be randomized to either ruxolitinib plus this BET inhibitor versus ruxolitinib alone, and we'll see which is more effective. Similar study with this PI3 kinase inhibitor called Parsaclosib, which has shown intriguing activity in the phase two setting, um, but, but hoping to see if we can do better as far as spleen volume and symptom responses with the addition of this PI3 kinase inhibitor. And then ruxolitinib plus loose patercept. Loose patercept is a TGF beta inhibitor um, or an active and receptor antagonist that's approved for the treatment of uh, a low risk MDS that has uh, a certain histologic features 
Um, but we're wondering if this may help patients who are anemic and requiring transfusions who have myelofibrosis who are already on ruxolitinib. And so this is moving forward with several different phase three trials in combination with both ruxolitinib and fedratinib, the other approved JAK2 inhibitor. And then interesting, we're also looking at this MDM2 inhibitor called KRT232, um, which is a pathway that is certainly upregulated uh, in, in myeloproliferative neoplasms and associated with disease progression. Next slide. And then I, I also quickly can talk about some of the agents that are emerging in polycythemia vera and essential thrombocythemia. Uh, this includes ROPEG interferon, or what will be known as BESREMI. Uh, this is a obviously a hot topic within uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms. Uh, this is a study that's been ongoing for you know, five years. We have five years of data on this, and it shows the ability to really control blood counts in the long term and reduce JAK2 mutant allele burdens over time in patients that can be on this for three, four, five years. Uh, this is the newest interferon formulation. It's given less frequently than our current pegylated interferon. It appears to be more tolerable than maybe prior interferon formulations and maybe is able to have some disease modification, although that's a very difficult thing to show. Bomodemstat is an LSD1 inhibitor that's been looked at in myelofibrosis and now is starting to be looked at in polycythemia vera and ET. PTG300 is a hepcidin mimetic, and this is you know, a, a kind of unique agent uh, to come into the spectrum. This is a, an agent that's really focusing on trying to eliminate the need for phlebotomy. So this is a, being looked at in, in patients that have a high phlebotomy requirement, whether or not they're on site reductive therapy or not. Uh, and it is given uh, on a weekly basis uh, to attempt to reduce the need for phlebotomies. Preliminary data that was shared at ASH this year was very encouraging on the ability to reduce the need for those phlebotomies. And this is a study that's uh, getting further along in the phase two setting and we'll hopefully see data uh, coming up at EHA here in about a month and a half or so. And then again, this KRT232, the MDM2 inhibitor is being looked at as well in polycythemia vera as a potential way to, to, to target an, up, uh, an upregulated pathway and maybe modify the disease a bit. Uh, so exciting times, a lot of new stuff coming down the pipeline, a ton of clinical trials that are, um, that are being offered at various sites. Um, I would highly encourage everyone who, who, who is interested to try to get involved in some of these clinical trials because this is where breakthroughs happen. This is where we can advance the field and really start to understand more about how, how to best treat patients. So, you know, I think that, that despite these being rare diseases, we're entering into an impressive time frame. We're going to have more clinical trials actively enrolling than we've ever had before. So it, it's going to be a challenge uh, to, to fully enroll all of these trials since they're ongoing at the same time. Um, and, we, and we're really going to count on patients to, to, to be volunteers for these trials and really help us. And, and I couldn't encourage it more. Next slide. So I think this is my last slide. So, you know, just leave with a bit of wisdom. As Michael Scott said, I'm an early bird and a night owl, so I'm wise and I have nerves. Um, and so I will, uh, I will uh, stop now. Um, and I believe that I have a, a bit of the next section as well, um, which is talking a little bit more about how we organize care within, um, within the spectrum of treating myeloproliferative neoplasms. I don't really have any slides for that per se. Um, but I can talk a bit about that in the maybe five to 10 minutes we have left before Dr. Tinsley gives her, gives her talk. And um, so, I, you know, I, a little bit of the background and we can go off this slide because it's a little bit funny to have it sitting there, but, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the, and we'll come to Dr. Tinsley's talk next, but, you know, briefly, I would say that, and we can go over this in questions so people have questions, but um, the way we organize care with myeloproliferative neoplasms and the way, you know, I, I work at Moffitt, which is obviously an academic center and a, and a, and a main referral center. Um, Dr. Uh, Diaz and, and folks work at Florida Cancer Specialists, uh, which is, is certainly, you know, proliferated across the entire state. And uh, most likely you have a Florida Cancer Specialist office that's within two minutes of you. Um, and, uh, and I think that we work together very well to try to take care of patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms because I think we both have different roles. Um, I often will, will advocate for every single person who has a myeloproliferative neoplasm, at least coming to see uh, myself or another uh, uh, specialist within the field at least one time. And maybe it is just one time because I think that, that we spend a lot of time trying to understand this disease and really getting into the nitty gritty as far as the details and options and trials and 
science and biology. Um, and this is, and I think patients owe it to themselves to kind of get that information and, and, and be educated in their own disease going forward. Now, I don't expect the same level of education on NPNs uh, within the community because it just doesn't make any sense. You know, most community physicians may have, you know, five to 10 patients as a maximum, uh, you know, while I see maybe, you know, three to 400 a year. Um, and and, and I, if someone came into me and asked me how to treat breast cancer, I've forgotten that already. So, um, so we just both have different roles. However, you know, the majority of treatments for myeloproliferative neoplasms are going to be something that can be provided by your local oncologist. Um, and most of the follow-up that's needed is, is stuff that you can have done locally, lab work, follow-ups, making sure you're tolerating medications, making sure everything's okay. All that stuff doesn't need to be done at an academic center. You don't have to travel to have those things done. And so I think there's a bit of, of cooperation that goes on where we like to stay in the mix and provide education, update people on what trials there are, answer any questions they have that are more detailed, um, uh, and, and still uh, communicate with the local oncologist to say, here's what I'd like to, to do. This is why I want to do it. Um, you know, I've talked with the patient and they, I think we're on the same page and oftentimes local oncologist says, yeah, absolutely, no problem. We can definitely help out with that. And then we just have to make sure those lines of communication are open where we can come talk uh, between us and, and make sure that we're all on the same page. If problems arise, we're, we're communicating. And I think that's becoming increasingly easy to do, you know, as, as those uh, relationships within the community are made. And so that's often how we do things. Um, now, when we, when we talk about things like bone marrow biopsies and lab work, I think that's on a, on a patient by patient basis. You know, typically for any MPN, I recommend a bone marrow biopsy at the time of diagnosis, just to make sure that we are solidifying having the right diagnosis. But after that, I really don't have a regimen of doing regular bone marrow biopsies, other than if we need to answer a question. If we can't figure out what's going on, then, then I would advocate doing a bone marrow biopsy. Um, lab work, uh, you know, at, at the beginning or when starting treatments, it's done as often as it needs to be done to make sure that, that everything's safe and that, that blood counts are stable. But once we get into a regular regimen, oftentimes we're doing lab work once every three months in patients that are on cytoreductive therapy of some sort, or we're doing maybe once every six months uh, in patients that we're just monitoring, uh, you know, uh, who are not on cytoreductive therapy. Uh, so it really is, is a patient-specific, individual-specific thing. And, um, and, and we work really hard to make sure that there's coordination in this care because, you know, this is a long-term a long-term disease, and that's our goal is to turn this into a long-term disease. We want people to look at their myeloproliferative disease like um, having high blood pressure or diabetes. Is it something that we're going to be able to cure? Most of the time, no. Uh, is it something that we're going to have to that, that we're going to have to deal with? Yeah, but do, we don't want you thinking about it every day. We may have to take a medication. We have, may have to take labs. It may increase your risk for some throm thrombotic events. But if we control it with the right medications, then maybe you know we can reduce that risk to a very low level. Um, so I'm running out of my time. Uh, I'm happy to answer any specific questions that people have either on the disease itself uh, or, uh, you know, on how we manage care, uh, the continuum of care for patients um, in the Q&A section that we'll have coming up. So I will now turn my video off uh, and I will uh, go on to um, introduce Dr. Tinsley uh, and ask her to turn her webcam on uh, and share her presentation, uh, Management of Symptoms and Quality of Life in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. Thank you, Dr. Tinsley. Thank you, I'm so excited to be here. That was a great talk. I always learn um, when it, you, know, you pick up bits and pieces along the way. And I'm a quality of life researcher, and I've been taking care of patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms for uh, several years. I don't want to tell you exactly how many years, because that would uh, tell you how old I am. Um, but really, if we can optimally manage your symptoms, we will improve your quality of life. And so I would just encourage you um, to share your symptoms when you go for your visits. And that's really, we're going to talk about how we assess symptoms and then um, some strategies to help you with fatigue, which is the most common symptom that really interferes with patients' ability to live a normal life and do the things that, they, that you really enjoy doing. Um, so, you know, we really want to get to know you when we see you in the clinic. And um, we can only get to know you if you share with us. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So what is quality of life? That's a really tough 
topic. And really we're talking about health related quality of life and it's very individualized. Whatever you think is a good quality of life might not be a quality of good quality of life to me. So it has to be, you know, unique for you. What's what's important to you? What are your values? And really based on optimal symptom management and I want to encourage you to be in part of that part of that uh, decision making process when you meet with your uh, medical team to help them understand you better. And then you can ask questions um, so that we can provide goal concordant care. That's a really hot topic these days that we don't just treat patients based on what we think is best for them, but that we lay out, these are some possibilities. Um, so let's discuss what's important to you. And really just you being here shows that you're interested in learning the disease process. Um, so I'm very happy um, that you're here and participating in an educational uh, presentation based on your, um, to improve your knowledge and understanding. And really like improved communication is what it's all about. It sounds easy, but it's really um, difficult sometimes. So we can go to the next slide. This is a tool that's frequently used in clinical trials, and we're trying to get it implemented um, to where we can track it over time. Our electronic medical records uh, prove they make that challenging for us uh, because if it's not embedded in our electronic medical record, we can't see how it changes over time. So on the left, you'll see there's the myeloproliferative neoplasm symptom assessment short form. It's a big word, but we call it the MPNSAF, uh, TSAS. And you'll see that at the very top, um, we want to know about the common symptoms that impact uh, patients who are diagnosed with myeloproliferative neoplasms. And really fatigue is very common for all um, patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. And it's really not unique just to patients who have myeloproliferative neoplasms. For cancer patients in general, fatigue is the most common symptom. So if we can come up with a treatment that improves fatigue, we will have improved a lot of people's quality of life. And you are a key member of that healthcare team. And like I said, um, if you, if there was a way we could assess this uh, systematically, then we could see how dynamic your symptoms are over time. Um, but if this is available on the internet, if you're interested in tracking your own symptoms and bringing them in for visits, I don't think there's a way to graph them, um, but you can look at them like maybe at a three month interval and see how your symptoms have changed over time. And um, that's what I like to do as a quality of life researcher, see how um, different treatments impact on the various symptoms that patients experience. And many of the um, drugs that are approved for treating myeloproliferative neoplasms incorporated these symptom assessment forms to see how the drug improved quality of life. And then you want to make sure that you, again, discuss your symptoms with your healthcare team and focus really on how it affects your normal routine and really help us understand what's important to you. So we can go to the next slide. So identify your goals of treatment. Dr. Kirkendall talked about goals of treatment. Uh, and again, what is most important to you and the symptoms that are common for patients with MPNs. We talked about fatigue, but concentration problems. They're not always just related to us getting older, um, but they can be part of the disease process. Um, so you might not think it's related to your disease, but it could be, so share that with your medical team. Getting full quickly is called early satiety, and that can be due to an enlarged spleen. If you're losing weight and it's not on purpose, um, that's a red flag for us to really um, 
take a good, do a good physical exam to see if your spleen is enlarged. Inactivity, are you so fatigued that you're inactive? Um, that can also increase your risk for a thrombotic event. Um, you know, not moving very much. Night sweats are part of the disease. Pruritus, we talked about that. Dr. Kirkendall talked about that um, previously. That's really um, part of the disease process. So we want to optimally manage that symptom uh, so that it's not bothering you all the time and distracting you. The bone pain, the abdominal discomfort, even without an enlarged spleen, patients with MPNs uh, can have some abdominal uh, discomfort. And you know, when you start on, if you have an enlarged spleen that's giving you quite a bit of symptoms, then one of the goals of treatment would be to reduce that spleen size so that you can uh, have more room and, and eat better and just have, you know, be able to wear clothes and not have a spleen sticking out. And sometimes the goal really is to delay the progression of the MPN, especially in your higher risk myelofibrosis patients. You don't want them to transform into acute myelogenous leukemia. And sometimes cure is the goal, but it, you have to weigh out the risk and then the benefit. You know, how, how high risk is your disease um, to balance out the risk associated with a transplant? So we can go to the next slide. One of the things that uh, Dr. Kirkendall discussed was anemia. Now, in patients with polycythemia vera, uh, that's the opposite problem where you have too many red blood cells and we have to take blood uh, to keep your hematocrit less than 45%. Um, but in the spent phases or the fibrotic phases of polycythemia vera, then it can switch over to the opposite problem where anemia is really the problem. And also in myelofibrosis, this is a common um, finding is the anemia. And one of the things you can be actively involved in is monitoring your blood cell counts and learning um, what the reference ranges are and then see how you fit in there and see how those change over time. Um, and then recognizing what the symptoms are of anemia. If you're having increased shortness of breath or increasing fatigue, you wanna see is that related to the anemia or is that related to something else? You know, if your hemoglobin is the same and you're more fatigued, it could be that it's not related to the anemia at all. I had several patients during this pandemic that they were so um, distressed with the uh, all the anxiety about, you know, were we all going to die of COVID, um, that that actually increased their fatigue because a lot of their um, mental uh, you know, capacity was consumed with worrying about, you know, COVID and COVID-related problems. And again, you see that in there about communicating with your healthcare team if you have new symptoms. One of the things we really try to do at each visit, and you can help us by keeping an accurate medication list, is to bring those with you, uh, bring those to each of your visits, make sure that we know what you're taking so that that can uh, help us problem solve if you have a new symptom. A lot of times, if you're doing good detective work, um, that you can trace a new symptom um, back to the start of a new medication. And then you can relate those and see, um, is that really part of the problem? You know, other causes of anemia, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, sometimes people can have bleeding events um, so we will ask you, you know, any signs or symptoms of bleeding? Are you having any GI distress? Do you have any gastrointestinal symptoms? Um, are you not eating well? You can definitely um, become more anemic if you're uh, eating candy and drinking pop all day. Um, and then worry, like I said, we do use transfusions as needed uh, to minimize the impact of anemia. Um, at Moffitt, we use and I think it's pretty much standardized. If a person has a hemoglobin of seven grams per deciliter or lower, then 
we would give them a transfusion with Pactor blood cells. But also if you have other conditions such as a heart condition or you have COPD, then you may need a, a transfusion at a higher threshold. Uh, some of the patients I take care of who have myelofibrosis, who had PV first, um, they really feel like they can't do hardly anything uh, when their hemoglobin gets close to eight. So for those patients, we have to document it, put it in our medical record, but then transfuse them uh, to keep them more functional. And then also involve your support team in the education process about how anemia affects you. So your husband or wife or your, your friends um, help explain to them uh, how you can be impacted by the anemia and not be able to do what you normally do with them. Or maybe you try to arrange events with friends uh, during non-COVID times <laughs> um, when you've just had a recent transfusion, if this applies to you. So we can go to the next slide. And so our strategies for improving understanding, our written communication really reinforces the verbal communication. And again, asking questions about things you don't understand. This is a complicated disease. They, it's not like telling your, um, your family or your friends about if you had breast cancer or lung cancer, uh, even just saying myeloproliferative neoplasm uh, can make them their eyes cross like I don't even know what you just said um, so you can include them in if they're that close to you and really understanding the disease and help partner with you um, to provide support there are several online resources for including your caregiver and your family and for you um, there's the MDS foundation even though it says MDS, we have a booklet called Building Blocks of Hope for MPN patients. And you can either have them ship that to you. Uh, Audrey in their office is very uh, responsive to patients and likes to communicate with you. And they uh, answer the phone. It's not just by uh, chatting. Uh, you can talk to a real person and she would be happy to send you one of the booklets. You could also download it uh, from your computer. There's also the Voices of NPN. There's NPN Research, and there's the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society under NPN. So we can go to the next slide. So I want to really just encourage you, um, you know, to be part of that decision-making process and help your medical team learn you so that we can optimally manage your symptoms and then improve your quality of life. Thanks. It was nice being here, nice talking to you. And if there's anything I can um, do or any questions I can answer um, later on, I would be happy to engage in a discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights, Dr. Tinsley. I'd like to remind you all, the, all of our attendees that if our comments sparked any new questions or comments you'd like to share, you're welcome to type them into the questions box. Uh, and I'll read as many as we can during the Q&A section at the end. I can see a lot of questions have already come through, so we'll have some stuff to discuss for sure. Um, <clears throat> I'll now turn it over to Lindsay. Lindsay to discuss uh, caring for the caregiver, a role that is often overlooked when discussing living with this disease. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Oh, I think you might be muted. I can't hear you. We good? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to be discussing caring for the caregiver. Um, we a lot of times we talk about patients and how we're treating them medically, but how important it is to uh, work with them emotionally. But it's oftentimes um, overlooked about caring for the caregiver. And so that's why we're gonna focus on that now. I'm not sure if you have my slides up. Um, okay, thank you, perfect. 
So next slide, who is the caregiver? Um, anyone who provides emotional support to a patient is a caregiver, and that doesn't necessarily have to be locally. Somebody who is geographically far away can be a caregiver and provide emotional support. So it can be near or far, it can be over the phone, just checking in, you're providing support. Um, just to have somebody to vent to over the phone, to cry to, you're being a caregiver to that patient. And even if you're not local, you can also help with appointments. Um, physically, you can be a caregiver um, by helping the patient, um, caring for them with bathing, cooking, cleaning, providing transportation. Spiritually, you can be a caregiver through faith. And um, who is the caregiver? So a lot of times people just automatically think that the caregiver caregiver role falls onto the significant other, husband, wife, or partner. Um, but it can also be a father, a mother, an elderly father, an elderly mother, a friend, um, any family member. Sometimes coworkers fall into the caregiver role. Um, statistically though, it actually tends to a lot of times fall on the children and a lot of times the teenage children go into the caregiver role which is hard because they're teenagers, they're not really equipped for it, and they still have school and all their responsibilities. And then second to um, the children in the caregiver role is the spouse. So next slide. Now, what is the role of the caregiver? Um, there are many roles, and this is just a few. There could be some that I'm missing. Um, when you become a caregiver, you take on the role of the nurse. Um, uh, sometimes patients, they get sick, so you're going to have to take care of them. If they have any wounds, you're going to provide dressing changes. Home care only provides so much. Um, you're becoming the housekeeper. You're cleaning up after the house, doing the laundry, the cooking, making sure the patient has the meals that they need, that they're healthy meals, that it's something that they can tolerate. You become the secretary, you start doing um, different tasks, making appointments for the patient. Um, you become the psychologist, somebody for the patient to vent to, cry to, um, talk to them, talk to you about their feelings. Um, chauffeur, you're gonna be providing transportation to the appointments if the patient, you know, they were saying with MPN fatigue, any type of cancer, actually fatigue is a very common um, side effect and symptoms. So they're too tired to drive or too sick to drive. So you're going to have to provide transportation to their appointments. And then also transportation for other family members. If you have kids and the patient was the person providing that transportation, you need to now take on that role. You also become the accountant. You start paying the bills, the co-payments, talking to insurance companies, figuring out hospital bills, um, and there's a shift in roles. So, you know, for example, if the patient um, was the mother and she did a lot of these things, the housekeeping, taking the kids to um, different activities, um, did the housework and the cooking, and now it shifted to the father who now has to do these things and it kind of happens overnight. So they don't have time to prepare for these roles or get ready for them. And now all of a sudden they're taking care of everything. So. Caregivers have higher levels of psychological burdens due to the sudden life changes. So it's a sudden life change for the patient and for the caregiver as well. Next slide. Um, what are some things that the caregiver may experience? Um, feelings of helplessness. It's really hard watching your loved one be sick, whether you're the significant other or watching your, your parent, your sibling, your, um, your adult child go through it, you know, they're gonna be in pain, you can't fix it. It's the loss of control that's really hard as a caregiver. You feel isolated. Um, everyone around you is going around your life, they're with their lives. Yours kind of changed overnight, just like the patient. It was kind of instant. You're now spending more time at home, taking care of the patient. You're not able to do your normal activities and you may not be able to work. Um, a lot of times caregivers, we have to help them uh, fill out FMLA paperwork because they just, have too many responsibilities now to take care of the patient so they can't go to work, which a lot of times is an outlet for caregivers to be able to talk to other adults to get away for a little bit. So now they've lost their alone time, um, self-care, so it's very isolating for them. Um, caregivers tend to get stressed. There's a lot of decision-making when it comes to caregiving. The patient may be too sick or not want to deal with the decision-making, so it tends to fall on the caregivers, among many other things. And a lot of times, the caregiver either puts it on themselves that they feel like they have to be the cheerleader and always positive or friends and family 
want to see them positive because they want to be positive for the patient. So it's this expectation that they have to be happy all the time. And that's a real unrealistic expectation because nobody can be happy 24 seven. And this, again, it, it happens suddenly and it's overwhelming. So it, it's really hard to put that pressure on, on yourself to be the cheerleader all the time. So essentially being a caregiver, it's overwhelming as for all these reasons. It's exhausting physically and mentally. Um, it can be extremely daunting thinking of all these new roles and all these new tasks you now have to take on that maybe you weren't used to. So um, it's okay to not be okay. It would be unrealistic, like I said, for the caregiver to be positive 24-7. Um, but all these things collectively can lead to caregiver burnout, which is why we're discussing this, because caregiver burnout is a real thing and it's not discussed enough. Um, and it's not discussed about the resources and things that we need to look at and do for caregivers which is very important. Next slide. So what do you look out for? Whether you're the caregiver yourself, you're a patient or you're a friend or family checking in on the caregiver or you know, on the outside looking in, what can you look out for to see signs of burnout to know, hey, I need to step in and help out this person. If you notice that the caregiver is tired all the time, sleeping more than usual, um, eating poorly, loss of appetite or overeating, um, overusing substances, um, to help deal with, you know, the new tasks, the new feelings, overusing tobacco, alcohol, um, any other substances, mood changes, um, sudden angry outbursts, crying for no reason. It's okay to cry, um, but crying obsessively or at random times, that would be something that would be out of the norm. Losing contact with friends, it's something easy to do when you're caregiving, but it, it's something that you shouldn't do. Um, when the caregiver is purposely no longer engaging with their friends or family, whether it be over the phone or in person, that's concerning. Um, and aside, you know, it can go either way, sleeping too much or not getting enough sleep, sleeping poorly, having trouble falling asleep, having trouble staying asleep. Um, this is rare, but sometimes, you know, they are positive and they try to be that cheerleader, but then all of a sudden it switches and now they may be blaming the person for the cancer diagnosis or for the situation. Um, or just blaming everybody else, and again, angry with outbursts, um, feeling anxious, depressed, sad, or hopeless, just a mixture of feelings. And then um, a lot of times it's very common that caregivers, because they don't have the time or they just don't want to deal with it, they ignore their own health issues, which is all, it's a big red flag. We need to make sure they're taking care of themselves. They stop making their dental appointments, their vision, medical, or any mental health appointments. Those are all signs and things that you can look out for in caregiver burnout. Next slide. So the mental health of the patient and the caregiver are synergistic. And what does that mean? Um, obviously, the patient is going to be going through their own feelings. Um, but, you know, if you have a caregiver who is going through all those signs of burnout, the patient's going to pick up on it. So it's not benefiting anybody for the caregiver to be down or depressed or overwhelmed. Um, it's, it's not gonna help the caregiver and it's not gonna help the patient, which is why it's so important that we avoid caregiver burnout and we look out for and keep the caregiver healthy both physically and emotionally for their own well being and for the patient. So I have the saying, put your oxygen mask on first. So um, the story behind that is when you're on a plane and the flight attendant is giving you instructions on what to do in an emergency and they say, you know, put your oxygen mask on first, then you help the person next to you. Well, when I became a parent and I flew with my husband and my son, I finally like listened to those rules. And I remember turning to my husband and I'm saying, that's ridiculous. What kind of mother would I be if I didn't first take care of my child? And my husband replied, he said, you'd be a passed out mother, which would be no help to our son. And caring for the caregiver is kind of the same concept. The caregiver won't be any help to the patient without their oxygen first without making sure that the caregiver is okay, without taking care of themselves. They won't be any help as a caregiver to the patient. That's why we need to make sure that the caregiver is taking care of themselves, making sure that they're practicing self-care and being um, the best caregiver that they can be and putting their oxygen mask on first. Next slide. So um, how to take care of yourself, the caregiver. What do we do? Well, we be aware. If you're noticing yourself that you're starting to feel overwhelmed or you have mood swings or you can't sleep, take action. Um, delegate tasks. A lot of time, friends and family, they want to help. They just don't know what to do. 
So as the caregiver, you can give out tasks. Say, all right, um, you know, the patient, Jane, has an appointment Monday at 10. If you could give her a ride for me, that would be great. If you can go pick up this medication, anything that can help and take one less task off of you is going to help you out in the long run. Know that you're not alone. There's a million support groups and support services for patients, but there are also are a lot of support services for caregivers that caregivers don't know about. So there's peer support, there's support groups, there's tons of stuff online, everything is virtual now because of COVID um, and over the phone. Understand and accept your feelings. You know, let yourself go through the different feelings. I tell my patients, you're gonna have good and bad days. It's gonna be a roller coaster. The same goes for caregivers. You're gonna have good and bad days. You're gonna get frustrated, you're gonna get overwhelmed. It's okay to be sad. Know that, know that it's okay. Don't put that pressure on yourself to have to be happy all the time. Um, breathe, it sounds like a simple one, but when I say breathe, and that's so important, I tell uh, my caregivers, literally work on your breathing. It's like deep breathing, meditation, even if it's like for five minutes, it can really make a difference. Just taking that time and relaxing your body and taking a deep breath, it really can help you. Take it one step at a time. Oh, I'm so sorry. Take it one step at a time. Um, caregiving is a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's a long road. So you have to pace yourself. Don't overfill your plate. You can you know, designate tasks to your friends, but also make tasks, daily tasks for yourself. Don't think you have to get everything done in one day. You can do it weekly, um, make a schedule for yourself and say, all right, if I get these three things done today, I'm good. And even making lists and like crossing it off, it's cathartic. I always tell people I love making lists. Um, Again, ask family, not only family and friends for help, but coworkers. Everyone wants to help, so utilize it. And again, take time for yourself, self-care. Even if it's 20, 30 minutes, schedule it. Put a reminder on your phone, an alarm, because you're so busy you may forget. That's what happens. At the end of the day, you're like, oh, I didn't do anything for myself today. Put a reminder on your phone, an alarm. Take 20 minutes. Do something you enjoy, that you relax, that you did pre previously prior to the diagnosis. Because again, it's important for the caregiver to get back to the things that they enjoy. Um, join a support group, talk to your peers about your feelings. It's very helpful for patients to talk to other patients going through a diagnosis. And it's helpful for caregivers to talk to other caregivers that are caregiving, to then to talk to maybe even also give pointers of things they can do. You'd be surprised about how talking to someone else can really help you. And if you're not comfortable in a support group talking, just go and listen. Um, you don't have to talk right away. You may find yourself eventually talking. Nine times out of 10, people eventually will feel comfortable talking. And know you're, that helps you to know that you're not alone. So next slide, which I think is my last, just to wrap it up, the ABCs of caregiving, which I want you all to remember is awareness, balance, and connecting. Be aware of your feelings. Cry if you feel like you need to cry. You don't have to hold it in. Um, and don't feel like you have to go into another room, which you can. If you feel like you need a break, go into another room for a couple, 10 minutes, whatever. But it's okay to cry. Let it out and move on. Holding it in will make it so much worse. And you don't need to censor your emotions. It's okay to express how you feel to your family, to the patient. Um, communication is key. Balance. Know your limits. If you know your limits and you walk away when you need a break, like I said, take a few minutes, find a quiet place. Uh, balance really helps because you know when you're at your breaking point and then you won't get to that breaking point. You'll use some of the coping skills. And connecting, communicate, get things off your chest. Don't be impulsive, don't get to that breaking point. Uh, pick the right moment, do it in a constructive, non-accusatory way. Uh, if you're overwhelmed and you need help, communicate that. Stay connected to others, don't pull away. Connect with your loved ones, connect with your friends and always connect and utilize your social workers. Every cancer center has a social worker. We are there for the patient and the caregivers, which a lot of times caregivers don't realize that. Um, our cancer center, we have support services for caregivers. So ask your cancer center, wherever your family member patient is getting care, what support services do you have for the caregiver? Um, there's telephone support, there's peer support, there's national support groups. So there is support service, support out there for you as the caregiver, so you don't have to feel like you're alone. So talk to your social worker. And then that's the last slide. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, I think that that's really a, a really underappreciated part of 
um, of dealing with a chronic disease and something that we don't talk about too much. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Lauren to, to turn on her webcam and discuss MPN resources. Oh, hi everyone. My name is Lauren. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to readjust. <laughs> anyway, just going to keep it moving. So hi everyone. My name is Lauren. I work with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And we can jump right into my slides. So um, as some of you may know, I just wanted to reiterate the mission of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is really to cure leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, myeloma, and improve the quality of life with our patients and families. And we do that through a few different components. And one of those, um, some of those are research, advocacy, and of course, my favorite support. Next slide. So the one of the best resources that we have is our Information Resource Center. Um, they are our trained social worker and nurses, and they can be reached from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. They are there to offer support for our patients and our caregivers. Um, you can call if you have disease specific information. Next slide. We also have financial support. So we have copay assistance, travel assistance. Our travel is a little new. It's really more, it's localized. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to call the number at the bottom of the screen, which is 800-557-2672. Um, we also have urgent need, and that's a fund that opens and closes, similar to copay assistance, um, but the urgent need fund is a great, um, it's just there to offer support. And then we also have a new fund, which really supports our CAR-T patients. Next slide. One of the most, one of, I could say one of our favorite programs is our first connection. Um, and you've heard Lindsay talk about support. And this is an opportunity for our patients and our caregivers to connect with others who have gone through um, some of the similar things that they're going through currently. And so this is really an opportunity to connect peer to one through the phone. Um, to just provide additional support. Next slide. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but it's hard for me to see, so I feel like I keep taking, leaning in. But we also have LLS community. This is kind of like face group, face group books where you can log on, create an account, and follow certain groups that really ring to you. Um, and it will allow you to just be part of the community. You'll get a question every few days, so they'll send a question of the day. And a lot of our patients and caregivers create community and build relationships. And again, it's really building that support. Next slide. And then, of course, um, we have amazing materials. We do have disease-specific materials, but these materials are also really good. Um, cancer in your finances, I think, is one of our most utilized. Um, it's an opera, it's a booklet where you can keep track of the services that you've received and kind of helps you see what you need to do. Next slide. Um, online education programs is another. Um, we actually had an online program last night, but we try to do these. Um, monthly on the national side, but also we do them locally as well. Next slide. Okay. And before I just, um, this you'll see that this is my contact information. So I am pretty local to um, North Florida. So my territory ranges from Tampa all the way up. So I guess maybe I'm not that local, but all the way up to Jacksonville through um, and over to Tallahassee. And then again, um, I do want to mention that we do have support groups. A lot of them are online just due to COVID, but we are here to help. We are here to connect you to resources. Um, 
And then two, if I know that you've been receiving a lot of information tonight, please also don't hesitate to visit us at um, LLS.org or contact me directly for more information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren, for highlighting these important resources. I think it's always nice to know where to reach out uh, for patients that there are resources out there that can certainly help uh, to, to, to get more information and to go through this. Um, so, uh, you know, the one thing we do want to focus on from a Flasco standpoint is that, you know, cancer affects each population differently and, and minority groups in the United States bear a greater burden for many cancers. The, the, the Florida Society of Clinical Oncology is actively fighting cancer disparities on many fronts. On your cancer journey, you can do your part by making sure you just ask. Help us narrow the gap. To learn more about cancer disparities and myeloproliferative neoplasms, please download our Disparities in MPN slide packet located in the handouts drop-down box on your GoToWebinar panel. All right, so now it is time for the Q&A section. We've had a lot of questions coming through already, um, so that I think that's fantastic. And we were gonna definitely uh, uh, dedicate a, a good amount of time to this uh, portion of the uh, section, since we have so many questions. So um, <clears throat> I will uh, ask the other panelists to turn on their webcams, and I will as well. Um, and I'm going to read the questions and then our panelists can decide uh, kind of who's the best to answer each question and we'll continue to ask questions that attendees send into the chat for the next little bit. Um, and, and as I mentioned, we're kind of going to use this and we will skip over the last portion of the webinar um, and focus on questions right now. So once again, I will be the last person to turn on my webcam as it looks like everyone else has. And we got it. Okay. So sounds good. All right, so um, going back through the questions, I'll start at the beginning. And I think you know some of these first ones probably related to my talk since they came through while I was talking. Um, but uh, you know, I do think that we'll get into some other ones that we can pass around the group. So the first question is, what is the criteria for a phlebotomy uh, used in patients with central thrombocythemia who are JAK2 positive? I was under, under the impression that it was used in patients with PV only. This is a great question. So I mentioned in the, um, uh, in the, the treatment uh, discussion, the polycythemia vera, we recommend phlebotomies to keep them at less than 45% for everyone. I didn't mention phlebotomy being part of the ET algorithm. However, I think that this is very physician um, uh, specific and, and it may differ. Um, it's true that in ET, it's not uh, part of the routine regimen to provide phlebotomies. However, in my practice, um, I, I definitely view JAK2 mutated essential thrombocythemia very similar to JAK2 mutated PV. And I think that, as I mentioned, there is a spectrum of disease where it can be challenging to determine, uh, you know, which, which, where you're at and where the overlap is. And so in my patients that have JAK2 mutated ET who do run higher hematocrits, maybe higher than 45 percent, I'll often work to figure out if that is due to their disease or if that is more due to some other cause. Maybe they're a chronic smoker or have sleep apnea or have are taking some other medication that will cause that to be up. But if they're higher than normal hematocrit is due to their disease, then I'll often uh, uh, prescribe phlebotomies because I think that, that it's likely to protect them to some degree from, from uh, um, thrombotic events. And, and that's merely because I think that if you know, if, if both if JAK2 mutant ET and JAK2 PV have the same JAK2 mutation, which is thrombogenic, both have elevated hematocrits. You know, the name the, the disease doesn't know the name of its like the disease doesn't know what we're calling it. I guess is what I say. And uh, and so I think by providing phlebotomies, we do offer an extra layer, level of protection. That's a great question. The next question is: Is burning sensation of the legs and feet and joint pain a symptom of ET? Um, and I will I will give a short answer, and then I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Tensley. But I will I will say that that we do see uh, paresthesias and and symptoms such as these that that can be seen in all of the myeloproliferative neoplasms, and and we do see a lot of I would say in ET we definitely see paresthesias. Uh, Dr. Tensley, what do you think? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yeah. I think it could be uh, from the ET, but I would look for, you know, see if you have other like 
illnesses, like do you have diabetes or do you have peripheral vascular disease? You know, do you have any cardiac problems? But I think of the ET patients I've seen, they do seem, uh, some of them do have a lot of uh, burning uh, sensation in their legs. Yeah, I agree. I think that I think that that what Dr. Tinsley brings up is a very <clears throat> important thing, which is um, the treatment of these diseases is 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 certainly a inter multidisciplinary uh, approach that needs to be taken. And um, there's various, you know, some of the symptoms are hard to really pin down if they're disease related versus related to something else due to medications. And I think everything should be looked at. Oftentimes. Mm -hmm dealing with things like paresthesias or neuropathies or headaches or tinnitus, uh, uh, you know, some of these symptoms that are certainly more often seen with the disease than without, we're still relying on our primary care physicians and our other specialists to, to provide um, symptomatic control of those things. Because um, while it may be disease related, it's still something that oftentimes the primary care physician has a better handle of uh, as far as what to do and, and what kind of headache cocktails to use or, you know, what kind of different medications may be able to help with neuropathy or paresthesia. So um, certainly can be disease related and, and we need all hands on deck to try to make these things better. Um, next question was, I noticed that you still use hydroxy, hydroxyurea. Is that for all MPNs? I think, you know, it's still the standard treatment for high risk essential thrombocythemia and polycythemia vera. Um, I, you know, whether or not it's the best treatment, I think that's to be determined, but it's the, it's the, it's the standard. Um, and it's it's cheap, it's easy, people have a level of comfort with it. Um, it was really first studied back in the early 1980s, um, and, and, and frankly, it's going to continue being the standard until we come up with something that's clearly offers something better. Um, you know, there's great data for interferon maybe, uh, you know, doing just as well as controlling blood counts and maybe having disease-modifying potential, but it has a whole different side effect profile. It can be more expensive. It's more challenging to get. It's a subcutaneous injection. You've got to give it to yourself weekly. Um, there's less experience with it out in the community, so it's not going to take over as, as, you know, it's not going to take over overnight as, as the standard. Um, so, so still, we're still in, in the, the archaic world where hydroxyurea is our standard of care. Um, but that's also not a bad thing because I think for the majority of patients that does the job is of controlling counts, of, of being well tolerated and, and is, is really can be safe long term. The next question would be is what would be the difference in recommending hydroxyurea or interferon first line treatment? This is similar to the question previously. Um, you know, I think historically we've said younger patients um, that, that we typically favor interferon, especially patients who are of childbearing age since um, hydroxyurea is not safe to be given during pregnancy or childbearing age. Uh, interferon has more of a safety profile um, if it's needed to be given during pregnancy, so we typically favor it there. Um, that's changing, though. I think that that um, you know I will often have the discussion with patients, just regardless of age, of the pros and cons of hydroxyurea versus interferon. I think it's you know it's just different strokes. It's it's uh, two different medications that can achieve the same thing, but they're entirely different. Um, and there's pros and cons to each, and it's definitely worth a conversation um, of going through. I've actually had patients say they'd rather be on something that they inject subcutaneously once a week than a pill every day, because that'd be easier for them to only remember something once a week. Um, so, you know, I think that, that everyone's different, and it's worth having that conversation. Uh, the next question is Ropeg, Ropeg interferon, Bezremi was going to be the name of it, seems to be more tolerable and longer acting. Is that true? Uh, would you keep patients on Pegasus or switch over to, to Ropeg when it becomes available? So it is important to know Ropeg is not available yet. Um, there was a, a, a hope that it would become available in March. However, due to COVID-related issues, uh, the FDA was not able to investigate all the things that need, they needed to investigate to provide that approval. So uh, fingers crossed sometime in the next, uh, you know, maybe in the short term, hopefully we'll be hearing more about approval. Um, I, I, in my opinion, Ropeg interferon seems to be safe, seems to be uh, probably a bit better tolerable. A lot of times in these medications, if you make them more longer, act, if you make them longer acting, they tend to have less side effects. Um, so perhaps that is, but in someone who I have on, Pegylated interferon, who's doing well, who's got everything they want out of the medication, I'm not going to jump to switch over. Um, I, I think that, that, that this just gives us another arrow in the quiver, as you would say. But 
um, it's not going to be something where I'm going to just automatically switch people off something that's working well for them. But, you know, it's just, you know, it adds to that conversation. Uh, and then I think the last question that's directed directly at me is going to be how significant is a high LDH? Um, so LDH is, a, is a, an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase. Um, this is something we often check in patients that have myeloproliferative neoplasms as it's a marker of cell turnover. Um, how significant is it? Uh, not that significant, but it is something that we look at. Um, you know, oftentimes patients that have essential thrombocythemia will have a normal LDH. You know, about 50 to 60 percent of people with polycythemia vera will have a mildly elevated LDH. Virtually everyone with myelofibrosis has an elevated LDH. Um, this number is not clinically actionable. I don't change my treatment or my view of a patient if it's high or low. Sometimes uh, when I do see it go from being a, a mildly high to very, very high, it makes me concerned that something's going on, but it may just mean that you know, you had a recent infection or something else that caused increased cell turnover. So um, not that significant, but sometimes it can give us a clue to, to what's going on diagnostically. Certainly in someone who's always had ET, normal LDH, if they show up with a bigger spleen and, um, and more anemia and a high LDH, then sometimes we think the disease has progressed to, to myelofibrosis. Um, all right, I'm gonna skip over one question, I'll come back to it. Uh, and, and, and give someone else a chance to talk. But the question is, having a hard time finding a good support during COVID, do you have suggestions on how to find support groups? So I will provide that to Lindsay. So there are a lot of good support um, service resources even during COVID. They have turned virtually. Um, the, so there's networks that can help you find them in your area. For instance, um, cancer care. Um, is one of them. I believe it's cancercare.org. And if you go to them, they will help you find a support group in your area. The American Cancer Society is always a really good resource. Their phone number is 1-800-227-2345. And if you call them and tell them you're, you're looking for a support group, they again can guide you in the right direction. Um, if you want telephone peer support, um, not necessarily a support group, but talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one. I know the LLS is a great resource, um, which I'm sure Lauren can, can talk more about. And then um, the Fourth Angel program, if you Google Fourth Angel, is also a telephone peer support program where you can um, talk to somebody else. And then your, your cancer center, again, utilize your social workers, they're gonna know they might have at your cancer center support groups and other resources, but the main ones that are national that can also help you go right into your area would be Cancer Care and the American Cancer Society are the ones that I recommend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's awesome, thank you. Um, I think this is a good question that I'll open up to the entire group uh, if you feel like you have a good answer to it, but is, what do newly diagnosed MPN patients and their caregivers need to be asking their healthcare providers and be focused on? We have to make a social work standpoint or? Oh, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I think Lindsay, from your side of things, what would you say that <laughs> Diagnosed, you know, MPN patients and their caregivers should be asking their healthcare providers, um, you know, when they're going in for their, their initial visit. Well, I always say it's really important to keep like a pad with you prior to your initial visit to, to jot down questions because a lot of times patients um, and caregivers, they kind of get the white coat syndrome or they feel rushed in the visit. So go through your questions. The, the doctor will sit with you and um, answer them all, you know, ask them what to expect. Make sure you understand your treatment plan. Um, you can write it out because you may be overwhelmed in the visit. Um, find out, you know, who the social worker is so you can call them if you need to ask any further questions. If you need them to repeat the treatment plan, go over it with them step by step. A lot of centers have binders that they can give you. Ask for a binder because it may um, have out, have it in the binder for you, everything to expect. Um, but because everyone has different treatment plans, um, it's going to vary. So just, you know, understand yours, ask your questions, don't be afraid to use your time with the physician. And then um, different centers have different ways to communicate after your visit. Um, I know 
my chart. I believe Memorial uses my chart. Cleveland Clinic uses my chart. I'm sure all the other cancer centers have electronic systems. Utilize them. It's a really great way to get to your physician. Um, they answer you within a certain amount of time. So if you think of something, you can then ask them. And, you know, I always tell patients, advocate for yourself. If um, there is no silly question, um, all questions are important and write everything down and ask if it's okay to sometimes record because because of COVID, you can't always bring your caregiver to the appointment, which is even more overwhelming for the patient and they can't remember everything at the first visit. So on, on top of writing things down, ask with the physician's permission if you could maybe call your caregiver on speaker or FaceTime them in so you're not the only one remembering or if you can record it. Um, but FaceTime is a really good one to use right now during COVID so that you're not the only one and you don't have to remember everything. Yeah, I agree. I think I think in in from a from a patient standpoint, um, one of the things that I think is important, and whether or not this is the patient, the caregiver role, the physician's role, is I think patients sometimes need to say, "This is what concerns me the most about this disease and this diagnosis," um, because I think sometimes the physician or um, you know, whoever's seeing the patient may make assumptions over, you know, based on their understanding of these diseases, and those are not always the same as what the patient's concerns are. So you you can also you can definitely look at the look at the physician straight in the face, and say, hey, this is what I'm scared of. Like I'm a, I'm scared that I'm not going to see this graduation in three years. Mm -hmm. I'm that uh, you know this is that I'm going to be a burden on someone. You know, because if you kind of make it known like the things that are concerned, then then the then the rest of that clinic visit you know, can be something that's directed at your main concern. And these are, for the most part, things that are, we're gonna be dealing with long-term. And if you have a major concern, it should definitely be addressed right off the bat. Um, but sometimes it's tough to know exactly what that concern is. Um, so, uh, and then I think it's always important to kind of ask, you know, what does this mean? Put this in context. What, <laughs> what do you think the follow-up's gonna be? Like, what are the different options? Like, how do you see this playing out? Um, and then realize that you're not gonna remember everything from the visit, so definitely asking someone to come with you is important, or having someone on FaceTime, uh, or recording the visit, because you're certainly going to forget everything and have a million questions right as soon as you walk out of the room that you forgot. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, going back a little bit, I want to make sure we get everyone's question in. Uh, someone asked, I've been feeling worse since being treated and getting my numbers down do you have any suggestions for what to do and how to communicate with my doctor best this is a tough this is this is such a good question because i think this is a challenge we've run into i think for a long time we've said the goal of treatment is to reduce risk of thrombosis by controlling blood counts and then we are so hell-bent on controlling these blood counts that we forget you know uh, that, that that we're taking care of a person who's dealing with this disease um, and so, you know, patients tell me this all the time as they walk in and they talk to their doctor and their doctor looks at the number and says, you're doing great. And they're sitting there just miserable. And the doctor's like, nah, you're doing great. Um, and then and that's, there's a huge disconnect there. Um, and so I think that this is, un, you know, this is something where you have to kind of let your doctor know and be like, hey, I know my counts are good. I know that, but I don't feel well and we need to figure this out. Um, sometimes this could be due to the medication. I mean, some people on hydroxyurea at high doses can get considerable fatigue and it may not be the best medication. Sometimes it's because there's disease-related symptoms that haven't been addressed and the numbers are good, but the disease-related symptoms are a problem. We may have better medications that could help with that. Sometimes it's, it's overall just the weight of the disease and maybe reaching out and talking to a social worker and finding support may be helpful because it's, it's, yeah, my numbers are good, but I don't know what I'm dealing with and I'm very confused and it's overwhelming and no one can give me a straight answer. So um, honestly, just be honest. And, and it's one of those things where um, I think this is another area where having a specialist helps because I do think that we're biased towards understanding that the weight that the symptoms of this disease have on patients. And when you are out in the community and you're seeing breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and then someone comes in with PV, you know, sometimes your ability to kind of give that the appropriate attention is not there. Um, and, and that's really not a knock on community physicians at all. It's, it's just that, uh, you know, it's, it's a different, it's different context that they're operating under compared to what we are. And so sometimes it's helpful to have a specialist that can kind of talk through some of these things and, and really under, and let you know that this is not something that you're dealing with alone. Um, 
I don't know, Sarah, if you have any other thoughts on that. I agree. And, and just really being able to paint a picture of, uh, like, if you can think of an example of what it's taking away from you that you really enjoy, you know, to help them understand, like, this is really affecting me negatively because I'm not able to do such and such that I like to do, or that my level of fatigue is so severe, um, you know, like, just really making it clear uh, if they have, if they listen to you. I think that's hard if you feel very rushed and that you don't feel listened to. Um, that can be challenging. That's but right. just be persistent. Yeah, exactly. Right? exactly. You shouldn't have to be persistent, but it, it is the case sometimes where, where people don't hear you the first five times, but they do the sixth. So, um, right. That's 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 definitely our fault. So we're not placing that on the patients, but it is it is um, you know you do what you can. Um, the question next one is if you have polyemia vera and are anemic, is that normal? No, um, but there are a couple reasons why maybe. Um, so first, I would say that um, sometimes when people have polycythemia vera for a long time and then their blood counts drop, regardless, maybe they're on the same treatment, same regimen that can be indicative of the disease progressing into myelofibrosis. However, other times we have patients on medications like hydroxyurea and higher doses of that may push the blood counts down into more of an anemic zone. Um, also, we're doing phlebotomies very frequently um, and that can also sometimes push the blood counts down into an anemic zone. I will also warn you that what we consider anemia is not necessarily what a laboratory considers anemia. And so uh, it may put an L next to your hemoglobin, but you might be right where we want you to be. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that that's an issue. And so sometimes patients are like, well, it says that I'm L. It says low right next to my numbers. And I'm like, yeah, but you're right where I want you to be. And uh, th this lab has no idea what your, what your disease is or what, what's going on. So a lot of different answers, but not generally speaking, not normal to be anemic, but certainly there's reasons why, you know, we may, that may, may be medication induced, maybe phlebotomy induced or a sign of the disease changing. Someone asked, can you explain to me what a TET2 mutation is? Uh, these are, you know, this is what we get from doing these, these uh, gene panels, these next generation sequencing panels. Uh, and, and what we look for are, are genes that are commonly mutated uh, in, in blood diseases. Um, the TET2 mutation is the most common mutation you're going to see. Uh, it's not specific to people that have a myeloproliferative disease. Uh, it is also not specific to having a blood disease at all. We actually know that it's the most common uh, quote unquote chip mutation. So that's a fun little term. It stands for clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. And what that means is if you took a bunch of healthy people in their 70s and 80s and we checked them for mutations, a good proportion would have a TET2 mutation. And it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, and so uh, while it, it may have meaning in, within the context of a disease, um, it, it also may not. Uh, and, and I know that's a real cop-out answer. Uh, but, uh, the other thing I would say is, is uh, TET2 mutations um, are not one of the mutations that's considered to be a so-called high-risk mutation. We actually don't think it really modifies the risk of the disease at all. Um, and so uh, it is just, it's, it's the most common mutation to see and it really doesn't impact disease risk or prognosis um, in, in myeloproliferative diseases. Um, going down, let's see. Um, question was, could patients have any complications from getting the COVID vaccine? Um, the short answer is we don't know, right? You know, the, the, the trials were done in, in relatively healthy patients that didn't have underlying um, you know, blood disorders or blood diseases. Our, you know, at Moffitt, we're actively undertaking a trial to try to answer some of these questions. You know, patients that have had uh, various cancers, including myeloproliferative diseases, we've, um, you know, checked their blood before they've gotten the vaccine and after they've gotten the vaccine to try to, one, see if they respond the same way to the vaccine that, that patients without blood diseases have. Also, we're seeing more and more patients in the clinic and, and we're, we're kind of trying to correlate their blood counts, their symptoms with when they got the COVID vaccine. Um, my general feeling is that um, it is that, that the COVID vaccine causes an immune response and immune responses um, can certainly be heightened in patients that have myeloproliferative neoplasms. Uh, we certainly don't know if they, people respond well, but I haven't seen any you know, very severe reactions in patients getting the COVID vaccine to this point. 
Um, and, and I don't really expect to. Um, certainly, certainly, uh, certainly I could be wrong about things, but, but in, in the patients we've treated so far, and I, we've, we've had most of our patients get COVID vaccines at Moffitt um, because we were lucky enough to be able to do that. And most of our patients fit those criteria of being able to be eligible for it early on. Um, and we didn't see any significant reactions uh, of note. So that's always reassuring. Please go get your vaccine if you're eligible, which is everyone now. So everyone go get your vaccine. Um, question answer now is, uh, let's see. Hi, Dr. K, can you explain the TAT2 mutation? Oh yeah, we did that a little bit. Um, is this troublesome for a post-ET, now PV patient with platelets at 2 million? Um, so yeah, once again, not, not something that I'd really take into account from a treatment standpoint, from a disease standpoint. I don't think it's, it's, it's something that may be you know, playing a role as far as, uh, you know, being present, but I don't think it is something that <clears throat> really adds a ton to the picture from what we know about what we know about TET2 mutations uh, at this point. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough question, but I, I, you know, I think that it's not something that we know enough about to really factor it into the treatment algorithm at this point. Um, uh, and, and most studies have said it doesn't really have a prognostic or predictive role within the disease. Uh, question for someone other than me. Can you talk more about financial programs, resources available to patients? Lauren? Oh, yes. I actually did a little research. Um, so for LLS, unfortunately, our copay um, is specifically closed. However, if you live in the greater Tampa area, we do have travel open, which is great because it's one of the things that I've been kind of pushing. And so what our travel will, what our travel includes is um, it, it'll pay for you to travel to and from your, sorry, to and from your appointment. We will not be able to cover food, but we will be able to cover um, I don't want to say airfare because hopefully you won't need that, but it, it could cover airfare if you needed it. But um, it's just, we're just, I'm just really excited that we do have travel because it is more localized. Um, so, and again, it's for the greater Tampa area. And if you do need more details of what that zip code looks like, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, and then our urgent need is open, which again is one of those funds which opens and closes, but it's awesome because um, we can cover both the pediatric and for this particular um, this particular group, our peds are zero to 40. And then we also have 40 and up available and open, which I'm again, very excited about. So that's what we have open currently. Um, and so the best way to learn more about that is to connect with me or to really reach out to the financial number, which I did put in my slide, but I can pull it up again just to give it to you if you guys have pen and paper and let me just grab it. I wish I knew the number by heart, but I do not. Um, so 877-557-2672. That's gonna be a great number to have in your pocket. You can also connect with your social workers as well. Mm -hmm. I know a few, um, I don't know if you want me to add them, um, a really great resource where patients can actually go and check is um, needymeds.org. Um, there's a, you can look by diagnosis on there. And um, right now, something called Good Days offers um, financial assistance for people with myeloproliferative neoplasms who can't afford their treatment. Um, so if you go to www.needymeds.org and you um, search by diagnoses, you can find the programs that are available to you. Cancer Care is listed as one and um, Good Days is listed as one. And the number for Good Days um, Patient Assistance Program, which is national, is 1-877-968-7233. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, next question is, is there a nutrition resource for polycythemia vera? Sarah, do you know of any nutrition resources 
No, I'm not aware of any. Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's um, certainly nutrition is something that various groups have been looking at. I know uh, Ruben Mesa's group at, at University of Texas San Antonio, previously at, previously at Mayo, Arizona, was looking at various nutrition. I know the NPN Advocacy International, um, NPN Advocacy International, Advocacy and Education International uh, is a is a large uh, support group, uh, patient resource um, that does often do kind of discussions or talks in regarding nutrition um, and various things within. Um, uh, there was a specific uh, supplement, American Ginseng, for fatigue and breast cancer patients, which we've tried. Uh, I have a lady with myelofibrosis that um, had good results with that, um, but there's really not been any randomized controlled trials in NPN patients, but there was a, it was in um, one of the reputable jur journals uh, looking at American ginseng for breast cancer patients where it improved fatigue, but it took about 12 weeks of taking it consistently. Yeah, that's helpful. I think um, that's, yeah, so I, I think this is a common question we get, you know, nutrition, people really like to be in control of their health and their diet, especially when they're diagnosed with a disease, because you want to feel like you have some control over what's going on. I certainly recommend, you know, a healthy diet, exercise. I think that, that good sleep habits, those things play a role, especially with the fatigue that's associated with this disease that we can't really do too much about as, or nearly as much as we'd like to. Um, and, and really making sure that you're having a healthy diet, exercising, staying healthy, staying fit, uh, getting good sleep, all of that plays, plays an important role. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of my favorite questions to answer was asked, which is, could you please share about uh, research you mentioned earlier and if there are new areas of research? There's so much research going on. Um, I think that this is one of the things that's that's very very exciting about this field. Um, you know, when we when you start, to, it's it's kind of a, it's really a domino effect. Um, I guess it's more of a snowball effect because dominoes just kind of knock each domino down. Snowballs build. Okay, so snowball effect <laughs> uh, that, that that comes when you start to understand more and more about the disease. There's just so many more things to look into and research. And so we didn't really know. What a JAK2 mutation was until 2005, a MIPL mutation until 2006, a CalR mutation until 2013, um, and then you know soon after we learned the JAK2 mutation in 2005, you have a JAK2 inhibitor that's approved by in 2011, um, and so there's a lag time between science and treatment, right? Um, and so if we're just figuring out about what a CalR reticulin is a mutation is in 2013, and we're just figuring out how it works two years ago, you know we knew that it was there, we just didn't know how it did what it did. Um, inevitably, this is going to feed into further research, and I think that's why we see 11 actively enrolling phase three clinical trials for myelofibrosis patients, which is just unheard of to have that many ongoing phase three clinical trials. We're like, we're like breast cancer or prostate cancer with all this research. It's craziness. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that what people are looking at is one: how do we make JAK inhibitors better? How do we get how, do we, how are we more effective at getting control of the spleen and the symptoms? How can we be better at improving anemia in patients that have low blood counts and, and make it so people aren't requiring transfusions? Um, and then the, the root of everything is how do we modify the disease? How do we cure the disease? How do we get rid of it? What are the, what are the critical pathways? Um, and whether that's, maybe that's not possible uh, when we're intervening late. Maybe it's only possible by intervening early in the disease process. And I think that's where a lot of research is going is, is there a potential to intervene early with a in a specific way that can prevent this disease from progressing and maybe even make it go into remission? Um, we don't know the answer to that, but I think that's that's certainly the direction things are going. And and there's tons of basic science labs out there. There's there's increasing funding that's going toward people that are focused on researching these things. So um, I highly you know, if you don't, let's say you don't want to be on a clinical trial and you don't want to, uh, or maybe you're not eligible for a specific clinical trial, please search out how you can become a, uh, on a, on a observational study or a tissue banking study where people can look at your, you know, patient blood cells are very, very precious to laboratory researchers and we can learn a lot from that. So find a place where you can 
um, you know, provide a sample that's as easy as a blood draw or, uh, you know, a, a mouth swab, and we can uh, get that those samples to uh, physicians or, or researchers, basic scientists that they can, you know, find our next big breakthrough. So please, please, we need, we always need everyone's help um, to to try to to, to make uh, advances within the field. Uh, next question is, what can we do to prevent blood clots? Um, that's the goal of treatment for polycythemia of ET. So a lot of times it's a baby aspirin for virtually everyone, unless there's some sort of contraindication. Um, it's keeping the hematocrit at a safe level with phlebotomies. And then in some patients that are higher risk, it's being on a cytoreductive therapy such as hydroxyurea. Certainly some patients have had prior blood clots. Uh, and, in the, and in that case, they're uh, typically on some sort of long-term anticoagulant, whether that's you know, warfarin or Coumadin in the older days and it's still being utilized by some patients now or, or these novel uh, uh, oral anticoagulants such as Eliquis, Apixaban, Xarelto, um, uh, Pradaxa, these types of things, um, uh, you know, those, those still would be recommended to take long-term and prevent uh, future blood clots as well. Next question is, hearing great news on PV treatment, uh, hepcidin, uh, does this work on platelets also? Uh, no, not really. Uh, so uh, the, the, you're referring to a clinical trial that's ongoing using a drug called PTG300, uh, which I think is going to be called Rusfertide. Rusfertide? Rusfertide. Um, and it is a hepcidin mimetic. Hepcidin is a, a protein that we make that is a master regulator of iron. Um, and so it kind of, it plays a role when we don't have enough iron, it, 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 it is low. When we do have too much iron, it's high. Um, and it helps to regulate when we absorb iron and give it to other tissues. And um, basically suffice to say that, that if you provide this hepcidin mimetic, it, it decreases the ability of our bodies to provide iron for red blood cell production. And then thus uh, we don't overproduce red blood cells, in, even in patients with PV, and you're able to avoid the need for recurrent phlebotomies, which is very nice for people that are constantly getting phlebotomies and then become iron deficient from all these phlebotomies and then have symptoms from iron deficiency, but then their doctor's like, now nah, your blood counts are perfect. Uh, and you're like, oh, I have a really iron deficiency in my hair, it's like uh, falling out and I don't feel well. And they're like, no, but your blood counts are good. Uh, so this is an answer to that, uh, and, and or hopefully is an answer to that, and that's what the trial is looking at. But it doesn't really do much for platelets because platelets are not iron dependent. Um, now, I can make a I can make a connection because some people who have iron deficiency have higher platelets, and if this helps to reverse iron deficiency, maybe the platelets will come down a bit. But um, but that's a stretch. Mainly, this is working on iron, and uh, it's the the need for iron to make red blood cells. So that's actually the last question that I've seen um, uh, on here. And so we were able to make it, I think, through everyone's question, which is fantastic. Um, is there any comments from the panelists uh, of anything that you wanted to kind of get across that maybe you haven't yet? No? Okay, fantastic. Well, I appreciate everyone's involvement, and there's a fantastic group of questions. Um, previously, we had uh, uh, discussed a video uh, that had been pre-recorded, but unfortunately, um, really due to all the great questions, we've kind of decided to move past that. Uh, and instead, this will be emailed to all attendees after the webinar. Um, it's uh, a very important discussion regarding patient advocacy, access to quality care, pharmacy benefit managers, and additional support. Uh, resources made available through the Flasco patient portal. So we encourage all attendees to watch it. Um, if you would like to be added to our mailing list for patient advocacy, please email info at flasco.org info at flasco.org for that and then that e that video will be emailed um so uh i guess it's time to wrap up and so i'd like to thank all of our panelists again for presenting this evening and leaving us with this meaningful information um, i'd like once again to thank insight for sponsoring this webinar as a reminder all of the handouts mentioned in this webinar can be found in the handouts drop down box on your go to webinar panel so please make sure to download them now Additionally, this webinar was recorded, so if you missed anything and want to hear it again, uh, it will be available on the Flasco website soon. Thank you for joining us tonight, and we hope you will join us for more webinars in the future. Thank you. Hello.
Um, I'd like to welcome you to the advocacy portion of our Flasco Living with uh, Cancer series presentation tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Diaz and I'm a medical oncologist and hematologist. I'm the Flasco Director of Patient Advocacy and a past president of Flasco. I practice medical oncology and hematology in St. Petersburg, Florida with Florida Cancer Specialists. And um, we're here today to talk about something that's pretty near and dear to my heart and it has to do with patient advocacy. And so first of all, I'd like to start off more from the big picture perspective. Um, and um, I've had people tell me in the past, well, well, Mike, talk about advocacy. Tell them what it means. Well, I looked up the definition of advocacy in the dictionary and all it says is to advocate. Very helpful, huh? So let me just explain. So advocacy, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, it's a general concept, but it means to advocate for, which means you're trying to do something to benefit somebody, whether it be yourself or somebody else. In fact, you all being here tonight to educate yourselves means you're advocating for yourself in the form of education, educational advocacy about um, a condition that might mean something to you or someone you know or care about. Um, so yes, there's educational advocacy. Um, your doctors uh, will also most likely advocate for you whenever they're fighting insurance companies to get scans or medications or therapies or testings approved. Um, we really don't get paid any money to do that, and that's uh, we either have to hire staff to do that or we do a lot of it ourselves too, but we're advocating for you. Um, the way, and there are many other ways besides education, you can advocate for family members, um, you can um, help assist with certain components of their care, and all that is advocating. And there are lots of ways to do that. The main way that I like to advocate for my cancer patients, because uh, that's one of the reasons why I love being a doctor, um, uh, in my free time, which is not a lot of, but I do spend a lot of time doing it, is I advocate for my patients when it comes to health care reform. Uh, one of the things that I noticed as I was going through my training as a young oncologist is that it didn't seem to me that there were a lot of healthcare providers involved with the policy decision making, decision making process that would impact patient care, patient's health care, or their access to care. And one of the things that I've been doing since uh, I've been practicing medicine for a little over 15 years now, um, I've been getting more and more involved with advocating for healthcare reform so that patients have access to affordable quality healthcare that's close to home. I'm a firm believer that we have enough resources in this country. There's, there's no reason why people shouldn't have to spend their life savings or, or, or uh, you know, refinance their house uh, just to get their cancer care. I think it's ridiculous. I personally think that the system is flawed in a lot of ways. And I think that there are a lot of people who are getting a disproportionate share of the resources and those are not the patients and I personally don't think they're the providers either. So that's one of the reasons why I'm involved with healthcare reform. And we do it in a lot of ways. Um, I work with organizations of like-minded individuals, whether it be other oncologists or pharmacists, we have organizations we work to advocate here in Flasco, mainly at a state level and also at a national level. But I do work with other organizations for Synergy and it all has to do with in understanding the healthcare system, which is extremely overly complicated. It needs to be fixed, uh, but it's what we have, and we have to understand it to understand where the problems are so we know where we can fix things. So if we need to, instead of guessing, we will perform studies or commission studies to be done to better understand the little nuances of how potential things are impacting patient care or access to patient care. Uh, and then we also spend a lot of time educating our elected officials on this process, whether it be local in Tallahassee, whether it be going to DC, which we don't do a lot of traveling now, but I previously see I would go to DC at least twice a month uh, to help educate uh, our elected officials there. We have to network a lot with Health and Human Services as well as Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And at a state level, we have to work a lot with uh, the governor's office, the insurance commissioner, as well as uh, Florida Medicaid uh, um, for a lot of patient issues. And just to give you an idea of how effective you can be sometimes, um, for those of you all that aren't aware, about four years ago, the previous uh, administration attempted a demonstration project that we will call the Part B Medicare Demonstration Project. 
And they thought, oh, we're going to save money. We're going to reduce the cost of care. And um, unfortunately, all it would have been doing was restricting access of care to possibly 50 to 75% of Medicare patients across the country because it basically refused to pay for the more expensive treatments. Well, if you have cancer, you know that a lot of the time, the most effective treatments are the more recent treatments and are going to be the more effective treatments. Well, they were going to try to encourage you to use more generic medications. Well, the generic medications in cancer care are over 10 or 15 years old and they're fairly outdated and not usually as effective as the newer medications. So it would have negatively impacted patient care. We went to grassroots across the country. We had have all of our patients contact their representatives and their senators and tell them that they needed to shut this down. We were very successful um, in that it never took place. Um, in fact, the following year, I went to meet one of our senator's uh, health care aides, and she said, you don't need to introduce yourself to me because of you. I had over 3,000 emails in my inbox. My email was locked. My email account was locked for several weeks. She said, you did a great job with that. The senator wasn't listening to me, but when he saw how many people were concerned about this project, he said he realized he had to listen. So we can work together, and we'll talk more about that. Um, I would like to move the discussion onto a more timely, more relevant, more um, current issue, which is known as uh, pharmacy benefit managers. And most people aren't aware of even what a pharmacy benefit manager is. And just to give you a little background, the pharmacy benefit managers are who your insurance companies hire to manage your oral prescription benefits. Um, they started off as just claims processors back in the 80s and 90s. All they would do is process insurance claims for oral medications. Well, over time, they evolved, they coalesced, they merged to the point to where there are essentially three pharmacy benefit managers that manage the oral prescription benefits for nearly 80% of all Americans. That's a lot of control and influence. Well, what happens when you have this control and influence? Stay tuned, we'll talk more about that. But these pharmacy benefit managers are so lucrative from a business perspective that they are merging with the top largest insurer companies in the country. In that um, the large, one of the largest pharmacy benefit managers, CVS Caremark, recently bought one of the nation's largest insurance companies, Aetna. Well, three of the largest pharmacy benefit managers are owned or own some of the top or largest insurance companies in this country. So there's a lot of vertical integration going on. And it's because this component of healthcare has become so profitable. It's like, well, why has it become so profitable? Well, these pharmacy benefit managers, and more and more we're learning about this. In fact, this gets us to something that's near and dear to my heart, the price of drugs. I think the price of drugs are crazy, they're astronomical, they are, they're very high, and it's difficult for patients to get their care because these newer medications and treatments cost so much. Well, studies are showing that when it comes to uh, brand name drugs, we don't even talk about generics, it's a lot more complicated. Brand name drugs, probably well over 50 percent of the cost of any drug, whether it be oral drug or IV drug, over 50% of that is going to somebody else as a rebate. Yes, over half the cost of drugs. So if you're on a drug that costs $1,000 a month, over $500 of that is going to a rebate in somebody else's pocket, not the pharmaceutical company's pocket. So a lot of people like to complain to the pharmaceutical companies about drug prices, and I'm not letting them off the hook. But when it, I, I, t I meet and I talk with a lot of the senior national executives in pharmaceutical companies, and they're aware of my stance that, that drug prices are too high and they need to get them under control and they need to do something about it. But part of the reason why the costs are so high is because of these rebates, these rebates that are given out. Well, these rebates are from the drug companies, but they have to be built into the cost of the drug. And one of the nation's largest recipient of rebates are these pharmacy benefit managers and or insurance companies. Yes, the U.S. government, via Medicaid and the VA healthcare system, they get some rebates. 
And they are a decent sized percentage of those rebates, but nowhere near as large as the rest of the rebates. In fact, some studies are showing that well over $150 billion a year in 2019 dollars was spent on rebates. And that's one of the reasons why the cost of drugs are so high. And when I talk with the senior people in pharmaceutical companies, they are somewhat traumatized after they have discussions with these pharmacy benefit managers because they have to talk with them and set up contracts before the pharmacy benefit manager will make their new medication available to the lives that they cover. And this is a typical comment out of here about, uh, for, that a pharmacy benefit manager would tell a pharmaceutical company, wow, we really like that drug, your new drug. It, it's great and we'd love for our patients to have access to it. But they need to know that we're given, we're do, we're working for them. So up front, we want you to give us a 10% discount off of the price, so they can see we're working for them. And then after they've paid their copay, and after all the claims have been processed, on the back end, we want a 50, 50% rebate. Otherwise, they will not even know your drug exists from us. And so these guys, they want their drugs to be available. And like I said, three of the largest. Pharma, uh, pharmacy benefit managers control nearly 80% of the prescription benefits. If you don't let them have what they want or some version of it, your drug's not going to see a lot of patients or not even have the possibility to be used for a lot of patients. And so there's definitely an issue with the rebate system going on, but also on the other end, the pharmacy benefit manager will also go after the providers. When I say the providers, the pharmacists or in the case of cancer patients, if the cancer doctors are providing the drug, even the oncologist, they like to come back to us about you know months after the transaction occurred, i.e. the prescription was given, and they'll just come back and say to the provider, either the cancer doctor or the, uh, the pharmacy, and say, yeah, you owe us 10% of all this money. And it's like, why do we owe you 10%? So, well, you didn't meet quality measures. And the, this is exactly what was told to my practice. You didn't meet quality measures. Like, we didn't know that there were quality measures. They said, well, you're correct. There's not any oncology or cancer specific quality measures. So, you know, we looked at the cancer patients that you're taking care of, our cancer patients that you're taking care of, and we looked at their adherence rates to blood pressure medications, diabetes medications, and cholesterol medications. And well, they were all perfect and they were adhering to their medications. So we couldn't use that data. So we looked at the entire Southwest Florida regional adherence rate to blood pressure medications, to diabetes medications, and cholesterol medications, and we applied that to you. And because the compliance rate in Southwest Florida is not very good, you've got to pay this penalty. And you know, my people know that if we don't pay this, what's called a DIR fee, direct and indirect remuneration fee, then we get kicked out of network. We can't take care of our patients. And trust me, if we can provide the oral medications to our patients, they will have much better patient care than if it's provided by some third party, especially pharmacy, that's nowhere near here that is no, that knows nothing about patients or patients' care. So we do what we can on our end to try to sustain those fees. But those are just examples. Now, that's how they affect the business end of thing, that's how they affect the pricing end of thing. But in order for these pharmacy benefit managers to make more money and to steer more traffic towards certain products, they develop these formal areas. And these formularies are, I guess you could say, their versions of preferred drug lists and that drugs that they like, and some might even say, yes, it might be the appropriate indication for the drug, but are they getting higher rebates on this drug and that's why they like it or not? We don't know. All that information is privileged and considered to be proprietary. Um, but they have these formularies. And we're seeing perfect examples of how these formularies that they're trying to implement on cancer patients they don't, they don't really work. Um, you have cancer, you know that you may have other unique healthcare conditions, and it's not like there's a plethora of medications with which you can choose from, which some might consider to be your best treatment option. Why? Because different medications have different adverse side effects, and some may have an adverse side effect profile that may be detrimental to you, given your unique health characteristics, or may not be better for you given your unique cancer. And so it's very difficult to say that just because I have cancer and it is cancer type X, that you should always start off with this one medication that these pharmacy benefit managers 
are saying you should start off with. And I can give you a perfect example. Let's tie it into patients. One of the things that we do is that we collect what's called patient PBM horror stories. And I do want you to know, if you have had any of these horror stories, as I will be talking about in a minute, please type in the little text box your name so that we can, and the best way to reach you so that we can reach out to you at Flasco and get your horror story recorded. Um, we do this at the Flasco level. We do it at a national level. I do it with a national organization I work with called Community Oncology Alliance. If you go to pbmabuses.org, that's P as in Paul, pbmabuses.org, you can see, unfortunately, volumes of horror stories that have resulted from these pharmacy benefit managers negatively impacting patient care. Just to give you an example, getting back to the formularies that we were talking about, um, we have several examples that have even happened here in Florida where a patient with a condition um, and other uh, cancer and other medical conditions, uh, for example, like kidney, bad kidney disease, um, should be getting, a, if you look according to routine formularies and what's considered to be the number one line of therapy, a medication that its number one side effect is that it can impact the kidneys, okay? Well, one of my partners saw this patient and realized, wait, you know, this patient needs this medication, it could impact the kidneys, um, they have bad kidneys, then maybe we need to start them on the second line medication first, period, and avoid this potentially more dangerous one. They sent the patient to a local cancer center of expertise and their specialist in this cancer said, yeah, you can have that number one, that first drug, that first medication, you need to start off with the one second on the list um, because it could hurt the kidneys. Well, it took the pharmacy benefit manager over two months to approve the medication because it was denied, denied, denied because it wasn't number one on their formulary. So we have several examples of where they can delay access to timely care. We even have examples nationally of patients just dying while they're waiting for their medication to arrive. Um, an, an unfortunate example of a patient who waited um, nine weeks for a routine metastatic lung can uh, breast cancer medication to arrive, but the pharmacy benefit manager fought with the provider for so long, the patient gave up after eight weeks, went into hospice, the medication showed up just after that, but the patient was too weak to even take the medication. Um, we have other examples of where um, the pharmacy benefit manager, I have two examples in my practice, not with me, but with two of my partners, of where the pharmacy benefit manager actually said, no, we know this medication is frontline and is the first one that's listed to be used, but we think the patient should have surgery first. And in both instances, even the surgeon and the medical oncologist said, no, 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 surgery is contraindicated in this patient. They said, well, no, we think the patient should have surgery first. So they're making a medical decision without even seeing the patient. They're making a medical decision without a license to practice medicine. And that's one of the things they're doing to save money and to help their bottom line. These guys are businesses. They took an oath to their shareholders. They did not take an oath to patients like the doctors did. And so if you have a horror story, please type it in on um, the question box uh, so that the people from Flasco can contact you, hear your horror story so we can get it documented. We need to have these documented. And part of the reason why is that we are working on trying to reform the healthcare system as far as these pharmacy benefit managers are concerned. We're working both at a state level and at a national level to give you an idea of what we've been doing at a state level, in fact, we've been coordinating with other healthcare advocacy organizations, and we attempted to have legislation passed last year for pharmacy benefit managers. It would have held and made sure there was transparency as well as accountability, because right now there's no transparency. Um, I was in DC uh, a couple of years ago, and um, was talking with some key staffers on both the Senate and the House, and they said, yeah, the pharmacy benefit managers uh, people were up here yesterday, and they were lighting their hair on fire saying, oh no, we can't be transparent. That will, that will disclose uh, proprietary information. We won't be able to save money. There's no way we can be transparent. Well, you know, this is healthcare. Everybody needs it. And if you have to be that transparent, then is there a reason for that? So we want reasonable transparency and we wanted accountability. And unfortunately, that bill did not pass. It did not go up for vote in the House of the Senate. But 
we will be working on that again for next year. And that's one of the reasons why I want to grab your attention. We will be working on that next year and we will need your help with reaching out to your legislature, your state representative and your state senator so that they will know they need to support this bill. Now, with that being said, to give you a little bit more of an idea of how conniving these pharmacy benefit managers can be, um, one of our other organizations developed uh, a study looking at Florida alone, uh, just to better understand how these pharmacy benefit managers worked in the Medicaid system that's run by the state. And just in one example, with a generic medicine, they saw that the pharmacy benefit manager was paying a pharmacy that they didn't have a preferred contract with. They're paying this pharmacy approximately 20 cents a pill for generic medicine. The patient needs to take twice a day. And they were paying a pharmacy that they had a contract with. Now you gotta keep in mind, this contract that they have with the pharmacy is not accessible to the public. Why? Because it's proprietary. Well, they were paying them $10 a pill. And when you sit down and you look at things, it would not be reasonable, given the fact this medication is taken twice a day, every day, within a year, if you assume a reasonable number of patients are on this medicine, it's a commonly used medicine, very commonly used medicine, that it wouldn't be reasonable for there to be a $30 million discrepancy going into this preferred pharmacy's pocket. So that has caused a lot of uproar in Florida. Um, that was not able to get this legislation passed, but it was able to get the governor to hire a nationally renowned actuarial firm to do their own study to validate and verify what this other study has, has seen. Um, if there's that large of a discrepancy, then if it's the taxpayer's dollars, I think the taxpayer deserves to know why is this pharmacy getting paid so, so much more for pill than your average pharmacy, okay? That stuff needs to be known. Um, there's been a lot of reform going on at the state levels because of little tactics like this, especially in Florida, especially in, I'm sorry, especially in Ohio and Georgia. We want Florida to be next, and so we'll be reaching out to you um, to advocate more next year. We're also working at a national level in D.C., uh, with a couple of different uh, bills, a couple of pieces of legislation. One, so that patients could get their drug within 48 hours and they wouldn't be waiting several weeks or even months to get their medication. Um, now, some of that stuff's been put on hold because of COVID, uh, and, but we plan on bringing that up at the beginning of next year because right now with the way things are in DC, not a lot's happening at all within um, the next several months because of COVID, because of the elections, uh, but we are working on it as we can. Um, so your involvement is essential. As I told you with the example, when it comes to healthcare reform, if your elected official hears about you, the voter, and they hear that you are concerned, they will listen. And we are planning on this next year, for this next 2021 legislative session, we are planning on having a bill introduced to help reform pharmacy benefit managers, but we need to have a co coordinated effort because there might be more than one bill out there. We wanna make sure that you are sponsoring the correct bill. We wanna make sure that you know why. So it's a good idea, I think it would be, if you are interested and want to help verbalize your opinion as a voter to your elected officials, that um, you uh, put your name and email in the question box, let them know you want the monthly newsletter. Uh, it's a monthly patient newsletter. That's one way to stay updated. Not only will you learn about advocacy issues, but you will learn updates about all the different things that um, we talked about today. And just as well, you can go to the website at www.patients.plasco.org to learn more about not only advocacy information, the things that I'm talking about here today, once again, it's to make sure there's a coordinated effort so that you know when to reach out to your elected official, you know what to talk about, you know which bill to tell them they need to support, but it's also to learn more about other things for patients, such as assistance programs, various support groups, as well as clinical trials, and yes, of course, something important and, near to, and dear to me, information about advocacy. And also we plan on notifying all the patients that have participated in these um, Living With Cancer series when there is a time we need to call them to action because you can help us, the providers, 
make sure that you have access to care that's affordable, quality, and that people are not taking all the money that's being designated for healthcare instead of it going to the patients, they're putting in their pocket. We gotta put a stop to that. So I appreciate your attention and please um, sign up for the newsletter, uh, go to the website, um, any questions, once again, please direct them in the question box. Uh, your questions will be answered, uh, but you all have a great evening. Thank you and God bless.